he'd been on um, paediatric wards. So it was quite scary for him on here. Um, his parents let, let us know that he liked to be called Freddie Mercury because that was his favourite singer. So um, that's what we were calling him. Um, on the night shift, Soraj came on. Um, and at this point, Dan, uh, Daniel was refusing to have any kind of blood taken, um, a cannula inserted. So we couldn't give him any treatment at all, which was obviously quite worrying with the sepsis markers that he got. But he had got full capacity, so our hands were tied, really. So we were all starting to get a little bit twitchy about him. Um, and then obviously Soraj came on the night shift and he was looking after him overnight. Um, so basically, Soraj, using his amazing skills, um, alongside Lee and Kate, all attended to him that night in order to get him to receive a cannula so I'm going to let Soraj tell you that bit because that's that's his little story. Yeah. Hi, bye. morning to all so my name is Suraj I'm working as a staff nurse and I'm working as a staff nurse in surgical assessment unit actually that day was really challenging for me because when I came to the uh, department I could see a, a guy named Daniel actually he has so much background history and he was scoring around 506 at the moment with a temperature of 40 degrees Celsius so nobody could be able to cannulate him because mom already told us that uh, he didn't allow anybody to cannulate him for the last 11 years or to take any blood even after his thyroidectomy has been done no investigation has been done so I was worried regarding his markers because it was really raised and we had to send him for a scan and also the doctors was telling because he's having the capacity he's 17 years old um so i was literally worried regarding the patient and i went and asked to the in charge also who was there on the night i think it's helen she told me you're fine in that so if you can't go and try for one time so literally i went to the room and the first question he was asking was that his mother was calling his freddie literally i don't know who the freddie was or the freddie mercury was so that was the first thing which concerned me really a lot uh, and he literally started asking me regarding Freddie Mercury, what are uh, some songs and based on things. So literally went off the ward and I went to one of my healthcare worker, which is Lee, and asked him who Freddie Mercury was. And literally Fr Lee told me the whole story about the Freddie Mercury and his songs, which is so much famous for. Then again, I went back to him and talked with him for half an hour in order to literally calm him down. And finally, he agreed for putting me a cannula that is only in a one prick. So literally, I was also nervous and Lee was nervous. We was playing some uh, great audios of Freddie Mercury uh, through the YouTube in order to calm him down. And we just went for our first go and I managed to get the cannula and I was so much thrilled and so much excited because literally we need to start all the antibody for him, take all the cultures and through the all the things going and happening on, he was asking me regarding some of the Freddie Mercury's past and how he died and everything like that. So literally after putting the cannula, I need to go back again and again to read the whole Wikipedia about the history. And it was a very terrible night with so many of my patients scoring and I have two ways to look after and also Freddie Mercury at the same moment. But still I managed to put the all the things for Freddie and I think he got discharged within the two days as antibodies has been started, his CT has been done and his temperature went down from 40 degrees Celsius, which was uh, high to around 37 or something like that at the night time. So it was really a good thing which happened to me in my whole career, which I worked in India also 10 years. But literally it's uh, randomly a very good experience for me to just look after a child with all this uh, background. So uh, after this also, he came back again and Claire messaged me again. He's coming back again for the cannula. He's not allowing anybody in the trust to put him in a cannula and he, know, he needs to go for a renogram. So the next time when I came, he started asking me, have you watched the same Stranger Things? And do you know Max? I didn't I didn't even know who Max was and what's the Stranger Things and everything like that. So I told him I will be coming back tomorrow because he was been appointed some uh, two days after for the cannulation. So literally went to watch the Stranger Things and I watched the whole series. I think it's four, four series in a single day. And I came back again and he started asking me regarding Max for the last day on the cannulation. So I literally told him he was so much affected towards Max. So I literally went down to the whole story and explained that I watched it for a long time. 
and then again the next time i put a candle up for him and his mother was also so much excited and she told me thank you because the second time that i don't know anything regarding stranger things and i watched the whole series in order to pop a candle up for that chap so this is the thing which i excited to working in this department because so many of the people in my surgical assessment unit also helped me to work out even the claire she also helped me throughout all these things pandemic and everything to and now my family is here and my child is also here so i'm literally happy and to work with a very good team so that's my story regarding daniel who used to call himself as freddy and just to add in as well he's been back again since um, <laughs> so again he will only come back here and i have to say that soraj was on his days off for both of the times when he needed a cannula and is me whatsapping saying please please can you come in um and the last time was when he'd done the video which we'll show you a video he really wanted to be here today um but he's gone to cornwall with his family um and he couldn't do the whole teams thing which was fine so we recorded as a video that we're going to show you in a minute um but his his mum was just so so impressed and so chuffed with soraj and unfortunately he's just going to have to keep coming in on his days off all time to to sort him out aren't you and see some more netflix series i think so the next time i don't know what series he's watching <laughs> So I need to ask his mom regarding that also. So if you want to play the video, please that that he recorded and sent to me. Hi, Silas. I would like to say a big thank you for looking after me when I was in hospital. I was very scared of the needles, but you helped me stay calm and. Talk to me about my music. I am so glad that you are getting an award for being a, being a brilliant nurse. Keep on, keep on rocking. Yeah, so that was lovely. I was nearly in tears when I got that off his mom. Um, and he 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 thinks that Soraj is getting a and a trophy. So I'm gonna I'm gonna bring in one of my son's football trophies, and we're gonna take a photo, and then I'm gonna send it to his mom while they're on holiday in Cornwall because he would chuff to bits. So that's us. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Soraj and Claire. I mean, that's phenomenal. And if we had a trophy, I should be only too happy to give it to you. Um, but I, uh, I look forward to seeing the photograph and I hope you send it to the board, not just uh, Daniel's mother, because uh, we, we too would uh, very much like to See that fabulous effort uh, properly acknowledged. Um, it's just a, a heartwarming story, and what an amazing way for us to start our board meeting today to be reminded of the exceptional care that's given to uh, patients in the trust, with people really going way over and beyond. Um, so well done and thank you. Berenice. I feel I would like to say a big. Thank you for looking after me when I was in hospital. I was very scared of the needles, but you helped me stay calm and talk to me about my music. I am so glad that you are getting an award for being a, being a brilliant nurse. Keep on, keep on rocking. Uh, thanks, Helen. Just just want to say a huge thank you to to both of you for coming along today and sharing that story. It, it's made my day. There's some tears out there and uh, positivity like that. I think as Krishna alluded to right at the start, that personalised care, but it's really clear that we're going to have to clone you. But you just can't keep coming in on your days off. <laughs> Fantastic work and such lovely feedback to hear from Daniel himself. Thank you both. And please, the family's all settled as well. Thank you. Um, Jane. Um, so again, I, I just want to say what a fantastic example of personalised care. Well done. Well done to the both of you. And I also just want to just commend Claire as well. I've been lucky enough to go on a visit to surgical assessment unit and I was totally blown away by her commitment to service improvement and to her unit. So. I just want to recommend to board members if they're looking for a ward visit 
um, surgical assessment is an amazing place to go. So forward thinking. And if we could bottle the spirit that Claire and her staff have down there, it would be just amazing across the hospital. So um, just to say thank you to everybody on SAU as well as just Rash. So um, as I say, thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you. That's really nice. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Um, I don't get upset. <laughs> Well, don't, um, but just uh, I hope you will leave us with this sense of the appreciation uh, we, we feel for everything you do every day, um, not just for Daniel, because Daniel, of course, is one story, I'm sure, of many, um, but it speaks so powerfully to your whole approach and culture and ethos and way of working there. Um, so we feel privileged to have started our meeting with that. And there's a lovely comment in the chat from um, from uh, um, Carly. Carly, Carly put the meeting in the, the note in the chat about she's on the case oh, of um, organising the trophy <laughs> and um, hopefully with some commissions um, is sharing the story more widely. So um, thank you very much for being with us and um, we hope you have a good day. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Stop there, no? yeah. yeah, wonderful, <laughs> Absolutely. lovely story. Um, so let's move, move on um, to the chief executive report, please. Have. I don't know how I can follow that, that really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a tough ask. It, it's maybe worth mentioning that I was going to say, well, Claire was still here, but, but it's not exactly a trophy. But SAU is our highest rated board on our ward accreditation scheme, so. It's not just the personalised care that, they, that Claire and Suraj and the rest of the team give. They're, they're absolutely a, a kind of beacon of good practice across the hospital. And that is reflected in kind of metrics, if you'd like, as well as our, our gut instinct about it. Um, so it's just to sort of reinforce what, you know, what's a good, how we should operate as a good, positive place. Um, so um, going back to my chief exec's report, um, I think um, a couple of things to start. So this is this is my first chief exec report in the substantive role as chief executive. So I feel slightly nervous giving it in that context. Um, I, I should start by saying by recognising, I suppose, the legislative I can hardly say the word change around ICBs and the integrated care systems because that that all came into um, being on. Friday the 1st of July, so that's very fresh, but that's now the um, legal system that we, we work in. We'll talk a little bit about that later. The other thing just to mention at the beginning was um, yesterday was the NHS's 74th birthday, and as a real highlight for me, I got to have my photo taken with a big duck. Um, <laughs> what better moment? <laughs> how, how, can, how can you sort of better that? Really? So, uh, these, these are the things you get to do. Is it? And to be fair, my chief, exe uh, uh, my exec colleagues all came to join and suffer the photo with the duck as well. So thank you to all of them as, as, as well. Um, but we did do lots of um, noting of that locally, and the charity was kind enough to provide uh, little cakes for everyone. Um, and we have you know, various things on social media because when it's been a really hard time, but it is also really important that staff feel that there's wider recognition of all the work that they're doing. And it's only a little thing, but it, it's a positive bit of a story in, in what's been a difficult couple of years. So it was, it was nice, nice to do that. Um, and obviously, we've got many, many staff who've been working for the NHS for, for years. And I think one of the good things about the NHS, and there can be downsides as well, but one of the good things is people really do feel it's almost like part of their family, and we do need to remember that, and we, we need to sort of tap into to that goodwill, because that's an awful lot of what keep, keeps us all going. Um, on a less cheery note, the, the, the report talks about visiting and masks, and how we recently, um, you know, stop the requirements for wearing masks throughout the hospital and we, we're just at a point where we use masks in our clinical areas um, but since this report was written and this is the reason we're all face to face here but a, a cautionary note because since this report was written Kings Mill Hospital obviously very nearby have gone back to wearing masks in all areas yesterday Sheffield 
have announced that they're going back to wearing masks in all areas and reinstating social distancing. So, um, um, fortunately, um, that is still an, an evolving situation and there's risk that things will at times go backwards as well as forwards. I think our staff have greatly appreciated not wearing masks in all areas, just like we're appreciating being face to face and it does add, you know, it improves our quality of discussion today and our, our quality of life, but, but we will have to um, be flexible as time goes on. We, we can't be rigidly applying things and we need to be responsive at times. So the positive bit is we still haven't got any patients with COVID in critical care or on the, the respiratory high dependency unit. So it, it is, at the moment, it still seems to be behaving as um, a sort of relatively mild viral illness, essentially. Um, but we are in ongoing discussions with our virologists and with our teams about what we need to do and if we do need to, to change. Um, but it's just a cautionary note, I suppose, um, compared to where we were. And the same thing applies from a swabbing point of view. We've stopped swabbing elective admissions, stopped swabbing people who come into hospital who are asymptomatic. But there's a live discussion going on about that at, at the moment. Um, so if, if the information I give you today is out of date two or three days from now, I apologise. That's not me, me being deliberately withholding information. That is because it is a very changing information. Um, uh, situation. Sorry, I mentioned smoking shelters just because they're up and live, and I know there's been lots of discussion um, over over many years, really, with governors and a board and things. But that that's happening now. Um, we'll have to see whether it's effective because, as you know, we're doing that as a, a pilot, effectively, and if it doesn't work, we'll rethink. But I just mentioned that to complete the the um, story, if you like, from that point of view. Um, Operational pressures, there's obviously um, been very significant operational pressures over the last month or two in ED, um, numbers of emissions, and then that combined with what Bernice said earlier on this morning about the staff pressures related to absences with, with COVID, which puts a pressure on staff, but it also puts financial pressures on from Steve's point of view, because we have to replace those staff with higher cost agency. Um, but despite the challenges and despite at several points in the last month or so being on Opal 4, I, I really think the staff have rallied around tremendously um, and really have pulled out the, all the stops to, to keep the hospital going. And despite the pressures, um, I'm pleased to say that I think we've managed those pressures and with um, continued providing a, a good quality of care to our patients better than some surrounding hospitals have been able to. So a sort of pat on the back for everyone, really, for, for all of that, that efforts. And um, I'll not go through every um, part of the, the um, report, but obviously I'm pleased to take questions subsequently. I did want to mention rural primary care, particularly around the CQC being visiting last week and this week um, regarding um, uh, Rural primary care. One of they've given their initial feedback to us, and one of the concerns is going to be um, about patient access. From our point of view, I think that's something that we were all aware of that patient access was a problem. And only in the last few weeks, Dr. Link's been put in. The CQC noted that patients that there's a significant time lag between things changing and patients reporting a change in their experience and they quoted some figures suggesting that it can be anything up to three years before patients perception of what access is like changes from when it's actually changed and, and I'm, I, hope, I hope people's perception changes before that and I hope the things that we've um, put in such as Dr Link and such as increased numbers of phone lines and increased receptionists do make a difference but um, it would be wrong of me to gloss over it because it is likely that in the CQC report there will be specific comments about um, access, but it is something we know about. But we also have to be a bit patient as to whether at, at what point people will feel things are, are different. Um, 
Keith, you may have some knowledge of that from previous practices where, where it does take a while. It, do, it takes a long while in primary yeah. care, I think. The, the, the contact is different and it, take, it does take time to see that, I think. Yeah. Um, I, I need to mention car park charges as well because obviously there's, there's been lots of discussion on um, about that and about social media. From our point of view as, as um, an exec team, we, we feel we really have consulted widely with staff side and, and with people. That's an ongoing process. It's not something that, that's finished yet, but we do have a proposed go live date at the middle of September to, to start charging. That's very much been effectively um, imposed upon us because of central directive that where we were getting um, funding for the car parking from the centre, that's been withdrawn and has been withdrawn since April. And if we don't do something, we're left with a, an approximately £1.6 million a year shortfall. Um, we have done everything we can to, to help staff with that. We are not charging our lowest paid staff to help them. Um, in line with national guidance as well, we're not charging staff at night. All staff are being charged less than they were before COVID. Um, and we've tried to get that message out, but of course, something like this is never it's never popular at the point you're asked to pay for something again, having got used to not paying. So um, it's just to reassure board that we, we really have consulted widely. We've done everything we can to, to lessen the impact of it sometimes. But I hope we're, we're at a point where people do recognise that, that we do, did need to do something because otherwise it was going to impact on, on patient care. Um, and then just the final thing to mention, um, to recognise DSFS and, and um, the, they, they had a, um, there was a sort of national day celebrating the states and facilities and DSFS were very involved in that. And I, I just wanted to sort of recognise again all of the good work that DSFS do for us as a wider trust, because it's often in the background and sometimes we forget about it, but it's absolutely critical to everything that we do in, in the hospital. So I just wanted to, to thank, thank them from, from me to finish there. And as I say, happy to take any, any questions about anything in the report or related matters. Thank you very much, Hal. Um, I appreciate the Chief Exec's report, not the Chair's report, but I think I might just add a few items before we open it to colleagues. Um, not least of all, to just bring out a few items that came to light at the regional meeting um, earlier this week, um, which provides some, some further context really to some of the challenges Hal's been describing. So the first one that I noted was that there's a 38% increase in admissions with COVID across the country, which struck me as really quite a stark figure. I mean, I know we were experiencing some of it, but we'd hear it described in those terms. Um, you've heard of uh, the two R's previously, restoration and recovery, um, but it's now the, the time of the four R's. So recovery, reform, resilience and respect seems to be the framework that um, our national colleagues and our regional colleagues are using to, you know, um, provide the context for uh, their priorities and how they discharge them. Um, it was described that the Midlands is doing um, extremely well in terms of providing mutual aid. And it was really nice to hear that, given the, um, you know, the effort we put into um, system level working. And the other point that came to light was about the digital health and care plan that was circulated last week. And um, if you haven't uh, read it, I commend it to you as a good read. Um, but apparently there were two or three other plans to come. And what I thought was very helpful was that Chris Hopkins, who you will know as the former chief executive of NHS providers, uh, now has a job at the centre. And his observation about these plans was how carefully they are negotiated uh, prior to publication. Um, which I don't know why I found such a helpful insight, but I did. Um, there was also a comment about the demand capacity plans that have been submitted, which of course we will discuss um, in our meeting shortly. Um, has been very good. Um, David Sloman was particularly appreciative of what it is they've received so far. And I thought it would be helpful for you to know that those plans are now going to go through a process of peer review. Um, 
presumably so that we can highlight areas of good practice or areas of risk mitigation that maybe one trust has identified and another hasn't or uh, what have you. So hopefully that will also help us mitigate the issues and risk that I'm sure will uh, loom large in our discussion shortly. And then the other uh, two points I'd bring, or three points I might bring out are um, nationally our colleagues are working with six trusts because six trusts represent over a third of the um, issues about handover, ambulance handover. I'm really pleased that we're not one of them, um, but there are a number in the Midlands. Um, and I, I uh, think that, you know, we need to be very mindful of how well it works for us here. And we're always thinking at this board, aren't we, about areas for improvement, but often improvement is about continuing to do what you do really well. And I don't think we've ever been um, in a situation where we think about ambulances as an extension of cubicles. In our ED, we don't. And I think that's been very proactively managed. And when I heard about the scale of the challenge um, some trusts find themselves in, I think it reminded me of the need to um, further appreciate and applaud all the hard work that's gone into that. Um, the penultimate one I'd raise was about the discharge work. <coughs> and this I thought was fabulous to hear. There's been a 45% improvement um, with respect to uh, pathway zero patients for those trusts that have um, entered the pilot about how it is you do discharge really splendidly. Um, apparently there's an orderly waiting list <coughs> now to be part of the next phase of the pilot. Uh, but I was wondering about the extent to which good practice from that pilot is being shared and whether or not there's any information that we might um, have regard. And the last one was a bit of a sanitary reminder that winter arrangements, you know, we always talk about winter plan, winter arrangements are supposed to be signed off by the end of July, um, which means that I presume we'll be very busy um, in the next few weeks um, looking at our winter plan and the implications of it. So um, I, I couldn't think of a better time to, um, to share those um, um, recent and important headlines with you that here, uh, but please don't let me distract me from, uh, or us well, from getting back to any questions you might have on that or Hal's report. Jan. Thank you. Um, just wanted to pick up on the COVID situation inevitably. Uh, and presumably the biggest threat to us is about staff absence rather than anything else. Is that, is that right? Well, I think that there's two significant threats. One is about staff absence and just gaps in our safe staffing. Um, the second bit is a logistical thing um, and it's the continued need when we have people with COVID for them to be in, we're running out of side rooms at the moment for example because yeah. we've got so many, yeah. so we haven't got a specific COVID ward at the point that we have to reopen, because there's a certain number of people, we have to reopen a specific COVID ward, that causes both staffing problems but also logistical problems about moving, yeah. moving people. So on a day-to-day -day basis, that causes very significant difficulties for the operational team. And if you're waiting for a side room, then that making someone's waiting longer in ED because the availability isn't there. And then that has a knock-on effect to other areas and so on. So it's that mixture of logistical and staffing. Yeah. Okay, Krishna, thank you. Well, the other complexity is that the COVID is an incidental finding and the majority of our patients are not coming in respiratory compromised and because of that it, it's about the complexity of where where is that patient best is, are they best to be on the specialist area getting the specialist support for why they've come in in the side room yes or are they best to put on a but it comes back there's a tipping point on numbers really mm -hmm. and that's why from an operations point of view it makes it really complicated right. and really complex to to judge that. I can, I can well understand that. <laughs> I can well understand. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to ask with the COVID, so patients are obviously coming in not realising they're COVID positive, I presume. If they know they're COVID positive, is the advice still for them not to come in or do we still take them in and then manage that? Or it, it's, their, it's their underlying present sort of clinical condition. But if, if they are, if they are, have got an acute illness, want in acute care, then they come regardless of whether they know that they're COVID positive or don't and we will sort of But in terms of planned don't. surgery and stuff like that we would that would add to our backlog effectively. Yes, yes it would and there's, there's, we're still awaiting sort of, some of the national screening 
um, to, be, to be sort of firmed up really just with the, sort of the elective because I think the way I think it's going to be changed a little bit because obviously there is a risk to outcomes for patients who have COVID if you're doing that in a planned way yeah. that's not good but but yes that there is a there is a, a, a obviously the knock-on effect is potentially we could be losing operating slots because that patient presenting is found to be COVID positive. And potentially Cancel pushing it. a longer waiting yes. time as well, effectively, if they yeah. don't have to rebook. Yeah. And that was one of the reasons for removing the, the routine testing of people yeah. who didn't have symptoms. Because at the point, if two days before your operation you have a routine test that then comes back showing that you're symptomatic, that meant it was very difficult to get someone in to replace that person because you have they to do, do the same test. Yeah. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. It's always been the case that we would, anyone with symptoms, we would, regardless of whether it was COVID or something else, in general, we'd be saying, well, you shouldn't come for an elective operation if because you're unwell, yeah. it doesn't make sense to do that whether you're already unwell with something. But it, it's that logistical thing again. Ian. Yeah, I guess <laughs> linking COVID to the next item. I think the next item, obviously, we've got the assumed COVID course, um, I think, from June. But we've also got a sort of, a, I think I saw a stat in the, in the operational planning of 1% of the beds are allocated to COVID cases. So I'm just trying to understand how the conversation we've just had sort of feeds through into the operational plan. Yeah, how far away are we already on those assumptions or three months then? Um, can we push uh, colleagues on notice to respond to that as we come to the next item? Yeah. Um, Sue. Thanks, Helen. Mine's not to do with COVID. Um, I was just to say thanks to Hal. Um, no need to be nervous. I think the report was excellent and I could hear your voice in it, which was lovely. Uh, and I think it's very brave to bring both car parking and smoking in your first <laughs> project. <laughs> so, yeah, well done. And then I just wanted to know on the EPR, um, I am on the project board for that. Um, and just wanted to commend the team that are running it under John's steerage, obviously, but um, Athar, I think, is project manager, program manager, and it's been really, really well run, um, so, and I think it will be a tremendous digital advancement for it when it's done, so just to note that, because it was in your report, um, it's easy to forget that whilst all the crisis is happening, there's teams of people working on that, yeah. and it will really move us forward, Absolutely, so thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you, Sue. I suggest we leave um, Hal's report there. Thank you again, Hal. And we're going to move into the next section of the agenda. Now, the next section of the agenda is all about management of risk and performance, and we have some very substantive items. So we've got the operational planning submission first, we've got the um, nursing establishment second, we've medical staff third, and we've maternity continuity of care of fourth. And that's before we get on to our strategy items. Um, so we are going to do justice to all of these issues um, in good time. So, um, on the um, operational and planning submission, uh, we're having a duet from Berenice and Steve. Um, who's leading off? Thanks, Helen. I'll, I'll make a start um, on the, the operational elements, and uh, then Steve's going to come in around where we are financially um, against, the, against the actual plan. So, so um, the papers that, that were submitted provide quite quite a lot of detail already, um, but just to, just to pull out some some key areas, just 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 to remind everybody around the NHSEI priorities, as was at the, at the time now NHSE. Um, a requirement to make sure that we are investing in our workforce and I know we've got papers later on in the board ar around that and um, delivering our vaccination program we're absolutely tackling the elective uh, backlog and um, improving our responsiveness uh, to the urgent and emergency care and community care and again you've heard a little bit about um, our handover delays uh, just earlier on there from Helen um, and the, the plans that we put in place here at Chesterfield. Improving uh, timely access to primary care and again um, primary care is much wider than our organisation um, but we, we have to contribute our part um, through RPC. Improving mental health services so making sure that we've got the right access as well um, at our at our front doors um, as well as being supported by the other organisations. 
developing our approach to population health management, um, exploiting where we can digital technologies, and, we, and we've got a good a good strategy around digital technologies and the implementation of that over the next few years. And and really important was about moving back uh, and stretching ourselves further um, beyond the pre-pandemic levels of productivity. So that's where where our real focus has been. And the final point, as as Hal alluded to earlier on, was the establishment of ICBs, which has now been been completed. The the, the guidance that that came down to us um, was very much about. Um, making sure that we exceed our elective activity and it was really focused uh, uh, around mainly the the elective delivering 10 percent more activity reducing our our weights over 78 weeks which was really important and eliminating our under, over 104 weeks and um, just to report at that point that um our 104 weeks that we were expect to eliminate by the end of june um we were predicting five we've managed to get down to four which is an exceptional position all of those four um, were were complex patients sorry three of those patients were complex one was a patient choice and they will um be um uh, they will be seen to and 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 uh, gone in in July and then we're focusing on the rest so that was really positive from the teams they worked hard on that reducing our outpatient follow-ups by a minimum of 25 percent and again making some great progress against that really key one here is improving our performance against cancer standards and making sure that, that there are some key targets that's been set uh, against that around 62 day um, wait and over 104 days but we need to focus on the whole program um, increasing our diagnostics uh, to a minimum of 120 percent pre-pandemic level so a real stretch on our our diagnostics Another key one is about not having, um, previously we had um, what was called a 12 hour decision to admit in our emergency department. So you could be in the department for six hours and then we would actually measure you from the decision to, to actually admit you to the hospital. Um, we're now looking at 12 hours in the department. So that again, that's really positive. We're working towards zero and definitely no more than 2%. And it's good to report that we're currently at one point eight percent at um, at Chesterfield. Uh, minimising our hand handover delays and sure stability of services and then the expansion of our urgent treatment centre. So it's making sure again that patients flow to the, the right areas. Um, and what will help us and contribute to this overall is making sure that we reduce our overall bed capacity to include virtual wards. So as, as Ian alluded to um, just earlier on, there are some assumptions that have been put into the plan and certainly one of them is, is around uh, COVID cases. And in our plan, the number of COVID patients equates to 2.5% of the bed base, um, which was used in a five day length of stay. We have seen those those numbers increase, um, although we are still containing in that 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 percentage number. Um, we are concerned about that increasing overall. Um, it would require 13 beds, but due to the the IPC measures that we've put in place, the ward capacity we have allocated five percent overall to give us that that flex. We have used a month 11 position just to, to use our activity um, and I'll come on to, to where we are with regards to that. Important to us is that we hold our position on length of stay and, and there has been reported to this meeting previously because of some of the uh, difficulties that we've had with discharge and, and the support from our community services. That has become extremely difficult um, and it does mean that we are turning around um, a lot of our pathway zero patients that, that Helen alluded to earlier um, in, a, in a shorter length of stay to try and keep our length of stay there. Um, important as well is that we ring fence elective beds. We have to keep that elective programme moving and make sure that all of those beds are not filled with medical patients, which has happened in previous years. Uh, we, we have allocated 38 in April 
um, moving from that uh, through June. Um, and we are looking uh, within this month to expand up to 56 beds uh, for the organisation to ring fence goals for elective. Increasing our day case, conver day case conversion. Um, so there are more procedures that we absolutely can get through our day case services. Uh, it's currently at 71% and we're looking to increase that further. Um, and then the, the, the final point just to mention is around our theatres returning back to capacity um, and really pushing the utilisation currently at 79% up to 85% um, and making sure that we're actually using um, those, those theatres effectively. None of this is um, with, without challenge. Um, and we, we have highlighted um, to, to NHS England um, with, with our returns that have gone back. And Steve will come on to um, further, further actions that we will be taking when he covers the finances. Um, but the, the, there is obviously concern with the increase in COVID. There is a concern around uh, the staff and resources. We continue to try and recruit and fill to posts to reduce our impact on, on agency. Um, that, there, that there is continuing changes in guidance. And, um, you know, we, we, again, we've just we've just had a, a new secretary of state come in. Um, and will there be further information coming down as, as a result of those changes? Um, the, the flexibility to meet unplanned demands where we've continued to see um, certainly our emergency admissions increased over 5% attendances. You will see by the performance reports that come through that, that we're managing to keep the admissions down overall, but the actual attendances that come through the department is really impacting on our, our um, flow across the, across the organisation. Um, and uh, the the flexibility to meet our our diagnostics, so just making sure that we've got capacity in those diagnostics, and we're we're starting to move ahead with the uh, community diagnostic centres and identify uh, an increased number that that could transfer into some of those services. The um, area that I mentioned just earlier is a, a real concern for us and continues, but we are doing a significant amount of work around this, and that is around adult and social care packages, um, making sure that we have got the right level of packages to support, because we have made a decision as a system that we're going to aim to try not to just place people into an alternative bed in nursing home or care homes this this winter um, because the impact that it actually has on them and the system and uh, and funding is quite significant um, and we can certainly evidence that and then the, the the final point is just around the additional staff and um, and the funds that might be required to to support that just just want to mention a couple of other areas is that the, the delivery of this, so the papers that have been submitted tell you what our submission is, um, but, but underpinning all of that, all of this is there is an improvement plan um, with a significant number of pieces of work. So you can see across dermatology, rheumatology, ENT, that there are pieces of work and actions that are very focused on making the improvements and that will be reported in at future, future boards across all pathways. The other thing to mention is that our Royal Academy of Improvement staff um, have been realigned to all the priority areas. So we, we do have resources allocated to cancer pathways, um, outpatients, theatre productivity, for, for instance, and certainly maternity services. And we're, we're looking at trying to increase some of that further. Also, finally, just to mention that this this report also has been discussed at our finance and performance meeting um, quite significantly, where we went into quite a lot of detail. Um, and and we, we just wanted to pull out a few areas where we had um, challenge regarding the COVID costs, because we're, there is an ask for us to remove all the COVID costs completely. Uh, and we think that is quite a big risk to us, given that we're seeing the, the, the COVID numbers increasing. 
Um, there is challenge around what's our confidence level uh, around theatres because we recognise that for quite a number of years there has been risk around theatres and staff and then we still have a number of staff that are on long term sick um, and some culture issues that, that, that we need to support uh, and, and help with as an organisation. Focus around cancer, really important that we don't just focus on those 62 days, 104 days and uh, the 28 day faster diagnosis, but actually some of our performance, which again, um, we haven't achieved for a number of years now, but we are focusing on those pieces of work and we can see some real success around where we did a, a focus piece of work around breast and showed some real improvements. So it's not that we're only looking at those priority areas, we're making sure that we're covering all. Um, we will make sure that we've got a detailed plan that supports this on how we actually achieve this. Um, again, further discussion around culture in other areas across the organisation. Um, and I liked what um, Helen alluded to before uh, about the, the, the recovery reform, resilience and respect. The respect element of it is so important to us at this point in time, and that will really help with our resilience um, in delivering this winter. Um, the team also want to see uh, the wider plan for the rest of the system, which is something that we're currently pulling together um, and we'll share back at a, at a later meeting and just under, understand how the, the rest of the system is contributing to this plan. So I'll, I'll stop there and, and just hand over to Steve around the finances and then happy to take any questions. Thanks, Helen. Thanks, Bernice. Thank you, Bernice. Um, so I wanted to kind of major on the risk section of the finance piece, um, but I just want to set a few helpful pieces of context before I do my possible. Um, so I thought it was just helpful to remind ourselves about where we stand in terms of model hospital and how efficient we are as a hospital. So we sit in the second quartile, just merging on upper quartile in terms of how efficient we are. So I think it's sometimes helpful to remind ourselves of that fact we're not usually an efficient hospital. And actually, when you look across Derbyshire, we all perform relatively well in terms of our cost base against national average. Um, I think we've obviously done a lot of work over the last month in terms of submitting a plan. So we submitted a balanced plan along with the system on the 20th of June. Um, obviously, we've had lots of dialogue, dialogue with regulators in terms of getting to that point, and it's left us with a lot of risk in the plan, which is fair to say. Um, what I would add is that all organisations with Derbyshire have taken an equal share of the pain, so we've all signed up to a 3% savings target, and by virtue of a non-recurrent CCG distribution of income, we've all got an equitable share of the allocation across the system. That helps us from a this year point of view, doesn't necessarily help us next year. So the, the allocation bit, we don't need to lose sight of that, that still is an issue for us long term. Um, in the slides, I've covered the transformation and capital plans in a bit more detail, just so I've all cited on those. I'm not proposing to talk through those in any detail, other than to say, Berenice has covered the transformation piece. The finance team are working closely with Claire Hinchley and Berenice's team in terms of injecting some pace into those plans in support of from a financial perspective. Clearly, there's still risk and still an awful lot to do around the, the transformation side of things. Um, one of my main concerns is around what we can release cash buys versus capacity releasing. So whilst I think there's lots going on, there is a danger that we'll, we'll free up capacity to do that work that then we'll use for other things such as COVID, election recovery. So we just need to keep sighted on that. Just going on to the risk slide, and what, what I was really keen to do is kind of stratify the risk through what I think are really clear trust risks, what are system risks and what are national risks. Because I think it's really helpful to think of it in those terms. And actually nationally that's how they're looking at things as well so i think there's a real national focus on delivery transformation and getting back to pre-covid levels of productivity and the kind of basics of grip and control of finance and good financial management so you know we're doing some work around some, there's a hfma a sustainability tool which we're talking about at hlt on friday and um, so there's some some assessment work we're just doing to make sure we're getting all that stuff right still um, but there's the, clearly that risk sits with us. We've got to get we've got to get the transformation stuff moving and we've got to make sure we're getting the basics right and managing our finances as well. Um, I think in terms of the system risk, the bit I want to draw out was the elective recovery side of things. So clearly that that 
the rules around the electric recovery operator at a system level. We are having conversations with the director of finance community about how we manage that risk and whether that risk sits best at a system level rather than the individual organisations within the system. So, so I'm hoping that might de-risk our plan, but not necessarily the system's plan. Um, but I still need to land that side of things fully. Um, and what I would also say is I think nationally everyone's found the Q, Q1, the electric recovery side of things, challenging. So I, I fully expect those, role, those rules to evolve as we go through the year. Um, I think the other system risks I wanted to draw out was the capital funding side of things. So nationally there's a huge capital um, constraint around how much money we've got. We've submitted a compliant plan as a system. Um, we need to agree as a system how we prioritise and how we manage those risks as a system because um, there just isn't enough money to do all the things that we want to do. Um, and the other thing is we, we've effectively committed as part of our balance plan to not spend some uncommitted um, items up to the tune of £27 million. Pounds. So there were some investments we'd like to make as a system that we just weren't able to in order to deliver our finances. Um, that has very little impact on us as an organisation, but it just goes to re-emphasise the need to make sure we've got the right financial discipline about how we're going about managing our money, and we need to play into those conversations at a system level. And I think just to finish off in terms of the very clear national risk, so very least is obviously covered about the COVID costs. We were asked to plan on the basis that COVID spent effectively stopped from the 1st of June. Clearly we know that COVID's still out there and that's a very significant risk. Um, we are working um, with the infection control team to make sure we keep those costs to an absolute minimum and we're following the latest infection control guidelines um, but we will spend COVID spend costs in June for sure. Um, and the other national one is around inflation and repression. So we did get around £2 million pounds of additional funding to cover off specific energy cost pressures, which is a national issue. Um, clearly there is a risk of other inflation and repressions, not least we're not sure what's happening around the pay award yet. So if, if the pay award is agreed at a certain level and we don't get that fully funded, that potentially will increase the inflation and risk to us. Um, and clearly RPI nationally is sitting, sitting around 9-10%. So the cost of all the supplies and everything else we need to operate as a business, the costs are going across the board. So we need to maintain sight of those. And I've included a slide then just to finish off in terms of next steps. But I, I guess there are two main things for me. So we're, we're writing a letter to our regulators on the back of the multi performance where we're, we're very much seeing these risks materialise in terms of our state performance, just to reiterate the very clear risk we see as part of our financial plan, um, but also making sure that they, they're, they're clearly committed to as a board to deliver our transformation and doing all the right things that we should be doing. Um, and the other thing is, I think clearly we need to do some more work on what we're doing to mitigate those risks, which I suggest we bring back to the September board um, to get into a bit more detail about how we best manage these risks in the year. But I think it gives us a good framework for our financial report throughout the year. And, and, how we go about forecasting and reporting that as an organisation. I'll pause there and very happy to take any questions. Thanks, Steve. I think um, Berenice wants to come back in. So, sorry, so, Helen. Very, very remiss of me. I just realised that when I was provided the update, I didn't actually state to uh, the board that the requirement was to submit a plan of 104%. Um, we agreed as a system that we were uh, responding with 100% of activity against 1920. We we have um, responded and we can achieve. We feel we can achieve 100% notwithstanding the risks, um, but we wouldn't be compliant at 104% currently at this time without additional um, actions being taken. Sorry. Thank you. That's been a really important update. I've probably had the best part of 10 or 15 minutes bringing the written report to life, for which we make no apologies. It's such an important area that we all understand it fully and thoroughly. But as our colleagues mentioned, it's also had a very good um, once over, if I can describe it in those terms, at a Finance Performance Committee. So I wonder, um, Keith, if I could invite you to comment first, um, number one, about anything you might want to say, but number two, to help us um, um, shape the discussion we need to have now. Um, yeah, so I think it's it's an incredibly challenging time, both financially and performance-wise, certainly the most challenging in my time in finance performance. Um, I think 
you know, we are where we are with the plan. We've put the plan in that we have to put in in order to work within the system. Steve's right to highlight the risks. They are significant risks. Already at month two, we're off our number and we're off our uh, SIP performance, which is, I think, mirrored everywhere. But we need to judge ourselves against ourselves rather than the wider context. Um, I think we talked about a number of things. We talked about a level of reporting both to the board and F&P, which is probably slightly different to it's been in the past. So we can find a way of using um, Steve's very helpful chart about risk and mitigations and um, not only flagging how we're doing against that, but flagging how the system is doing against that, because a huge element of this is, out, is partially outside of our control, and that presents us with you know, increased risk in that sense. Um, we started talking about the fact that we'll do cash flow forecasts probably for the first time ever because that's pertinent this year. And that is a statement in its own right that we actually have to think very carefully about Nora's point yesterday, whether we can actually pay the bills each month. And although there are mitigating actions to deal with that within the NHS, there are some oversight and penalties that come with that uh, action should we need to. So if we can avoid that, that would be advantageous. Um, so I think I think the report is incredibly comprehensive. I think the our our view that we have to oversee it, look at it from an F and P point of view, but also more broadly from the board. I think the output to your second question, Helen, is that as a board we are going to have to have a series of very difficult conversations about what we do and what we don't do, because there is stuff that is not in this plan that we know we need to do in order to allow Berenice and the team to hit their performance. Critical care being a good example for that, which isn't in here. We talked about theatres yesterday, F and P, in terms of some capabilities and some digital capabilities that might increase our theatre capability. None of that is costed in here. So we are going to have to have a series of very difficult conversations as a board, I think, about what we do less of, which we can't really afford to do less of anything, but we're going to have to, in order to deliver against this. But I think for me, the critical bit we talked about yesterday, long and hard at F and P, is making sure that we don't lose the disconnect between this plan and the reality of what we do every day in the hospital for the patient that walks in this afternoon or gets admitted tomorrow afternoon, because there is a slight disconnect between, and it was, it was interesting, we had a conversation about cancer numbers, for example, whereas in Berenice's current performance plan, we are compliant with the plan. But actually, if you look at the IPR, we are lacking in a number of areas that we have been for a while. And it's how we bring that plan and that together so that we don't disconnect the two. Because the danger is we deliver to this plan, but we disconnect from the reality of where we are as a trust and the performance that we then deliver to the patient who walks in the door. And that isn't going to be an easy, that's a knife edge to walk, I think, in reality. But that's, I think, what we probably have to vex ourselves as a board is to make those decisions and I think we need the executive and Steve and the team and Berenice to come back and say here is what we think we can do less of and here's what we think we need to do more of um, but we will none of those decisions will be palatably easy to make financially. So I think what you're um, escalating for us out of F&P committee really Keith, is the fact that there are a series of very hard choices to be made um, if we were to keep the plan in balance with our standards of service as measured through our KPIs and managing those choices and risks over the coming months. Yes, and an increasing level of pressure COVID we've talked about already, which it, you know, hasn't disappeared at the end of June, nor is it going to disappear at the end of June. And that just puts a greater level of pressure on an already massively pressured system. Yes. So um, I think September is the right time to start that conversation, but I think we need to be clear on how difficult a conversation it will be. Yes, and no doubt um, F&P will be having a, a, a preliminary discussion we before will do, that comes yes. to board yeah. in September, which again I'm sure will help us. And give Steve and colleagues time, as you've suggested you need to do, to talk about the system response to managing these risks collectively. Nora? Um, it was just to um, um, add to um, what Keith had done was around flexibility. We very much welcomed um, the, the risk um, register or the, the identification of risks uh, that Stephen pulled together. But part of the pressure is also going to be um, around those inflationary items, for example, around drugs, um, where we can't anticipate what costs are going to be and then how we can flex and how that will impact on the decisions that we maybe make or have made on priority for spending capital investment, for instance. So it's going to be a, a constantly 
moving feast, if you like, and balancing act, and I think we just need to be prepared to, um, you know, respond quickly. So, um, would it be fair to say that uh, the actions we've identified on the back of that is that we're going to flag to system colleagues and uh, colleagues in NHSE now the risks we're carrying. We're going to have a discussion about how it is we work collectively to mitigate them. Um, the FMP committee will um, have the first count around the proposed mitigations to these risks for us to manage through to a good place by year end and the board is on notice of some tricky and difficult decisions at the September meeting. And I think we'll need a reasonably substantial amount of time, Helen, to debate that but in September rather than trying to coalesce it into a short point. I think it needs it will need some time to debate the big. That's very helpful. Um, so um, that was my best uh, best chance at um, summarising. I'm pleased mindful that we have three other very substantive items in this particular section of the agenda. But three more hands: Jane, Ian, and Anton, and Jeremy. So could you be very uh, to the point, please? Yeah, sorry, Helen. This is not this is not going to impact your summary. Um, I, I wanted to thank Keith um, because I raised some issues going into F and P outside of the meeting, and, and Steve for looking at again just giving us some assurance around our our efficiency, if you like, around model hospital, and also about the challenge being equal across the system. Um, but what I wanted to say was I really think that we really do have to have really good, robust reporting on the system position. Because clearly, if our, our, if our partners have any difficulty around delivery of their SIP, actually that's going to impact the position of everybody. Um, so I'm just going to welcome and really robust uh, reporting on the position across the system as well as within our trust going forward. And I also wanted to tie together a matter around operational stuff that um, Barony's just alluded to. So she just spoke about um, discharging our patients to the right setting and actually the impact that that has on people's quality of life and actually the impact it has on our older person's length of life. So discharging patients to the wrong setting into a holding setting is costing this system a lot of money and is actually impacting the health outcomes of those patients. So I really want to see um, our trust pay its part in driving a piece of work forward with the system on that. Um, I think our spend on continuing health care as a system may be somewhere in the region of 80 to 100 million pounds. And actually, if that is not delivering the best for our patients and our patients are not being discharged into the best possible setting, uh, I think it is beholden on us to, to play our part in addressing that. So um, I just uh, would like to flag that up as well. I know I know Berenice is on with a piece of work and I know um, various improvement people have been involved in discussions as I have myself. And uh, I think that's really important. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Jane. Ian. Um, I guess I'd like to start by thanking the work that's gone on. I think I feel in a, a yeah, it's not any more comfortable place, but I think a better governed place now than we were a few weeks ago. So thank you for that. Um, I think the second one is probably the same point as Jane from a, yeah, which is the coherency plan, and actually having enough metrics to understand that actually, as Ben has talked about, that actually if we address some issues, that frees up resources from where. And I guess you wouldn't expect the art chair not to ask the question as to whether we should be adjusting our BAF risk in this area um, as we go through this, as that process, recognising that we are running higher risks, I guess, in BAF 3 and BAF 4 particularly. And that whether we as a board should consider that now or do that in the September time frame. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. I'll ask colleagues to come back on that in a moment. But let's go to Atul and then Jeremy and uh, perhaps uh, Steve or Hannah would like to respond on Ian's particular question. Just very briefly, and, 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 and knowing governors and, and, and members of the public, this is a serious area. And what I've observed from the sidelines as a board member is how well uh, our executive and non executive colleagues have gone through this and, and, and addressed the kinds of issues. There have been several iterations that I've uh, observed on all of this, and I would go so far as to say it's an exemplary kind of process that's been gone through in terms of challenge and in terms of response. Uh, so I think I think I just wanted to put that on the record. 
I know how much hard work has gone into this. It is an area we're going to have to keep on top of as the year progresses. Thank you. Thank you, Ashton. Jeremy? Um, quick question and an observation. The question is, on this scatter plot on page 25 of my pad, I can't see where we are, but it may be that I, it just doesn't show up. Where the apologies, the, the, the muscle line, the muscle lines on the thing. So it, it's it's a sense of that, Jeremy. So we're just we're just inside in the top left quadrant, which oh uh, right, okay, which is where we want to be. Okay, yeah, good, thank you. Um, the other thing, which is perhaps a relatively minor point, given all the hard work that's gone on, I was struck by the twenty five percent reduction in outpatient visits that we're required to get, and I'm I'm just slightly anxious, and perhaps there should be a separate conversation out of this, that that might have some significant adverse consequences that aren't being anticipated. So first question I wonder is what our GP colleagues think about this, because GP colleagues historically complain about hospital work being shifted back into primary care. I see some <laughs> recognition around the table that that's, might be a problem. Um, and the second thing is that it might, it might just backfire, because we reduce the number of follow-ups, and we end up with a load more um, re-referrals. And I, I, again, perhaps outside of this meeting, I, I value a conversation about how we've assessed the risk of um, adverse consequences from achieving that target, which I recognise that we're required to do. Okay. So we've had. A a couple of particular questions that need some um, response now. Uh, who'd like to take those? Did, um, a couple of, if I comment on, other people may like to come in. So Jeremy's particular one about the outpatients, this, this is to a very large degree an arbitrary figure that's been kind of plucked out of the air. What I would like to think our trust will do is that we should be efficient and sensible and we should discharge people where that's appropriate but we should never do that when that's not clinically appropriate and that would be the message that I would be given to all of our teams that yes of course we should use patient initiated follow-up and so on in order to minimize unnecessary appointments and there are some of them but we shouldn't be discharging people regardless and you're absolutely right if we were to do that that would cause uproar amongst our primary care colleagues which I suspect would be counterproductive in the long run. So I think we have to be aware of it. It is a national target, but we have to be sensible in our response to it. Um, I think um, the, the question about the BAF, and particularly the BAF 3, is a very interesting one because essentially the, the risk that we have there is that we're not contributing fully to the system and not doing our bit in the system. Whereas in lots of ways, a lot of the risk for us as an organisation is to do with the system not contributing fully and then that having an impact on us. Now, how we manage that as an, an individual trust is, is very difficult. What I hope would happen is that the ICB going forwards would hold the individual organisations to account about that performance and that as things developed over time that would become a more robust process but there's clearly a risk that from an because we're being judged to a large extent on a system performance around elective recovery funds and and you know it could be that we completely underperform and that damages Derby's income or the other way around but either way the the risk in some ways perhaps isn't entirely the correctly stated risk and I think that's maybe something that that's in the workshops that that um, you've already started in with Berenice about the, the bath that we do need to discuss further I don't have an, an instant solution for it and I don't think it would be appropriate if I did do that but I think it is a recognition that the risk as stated at the moment is perhaps a little bit back to front almost Helen, can I talk to back four and five, which is Ian's point? So, um, because we had a slightly rescheduled FMP, um, we we did a shortened FMP yesterday to talk about the papers that came today. We have a second FMP on the fifteenth, so week on Friday, where we'll look at the more normal matters, but we'll also look at back four and five. And I, I won't preempt, but my view would be we will be escalating um, the finance back. It's already 
read from an assurance point of view, because I think we will be escalating the severity of the back based on that conversation. But I don't want to preempt the conversation a week on Friday, but I suspect that would how have normally come out of FNP, I think, the week before. But because of the rescheduling, we weren't able to do that yesterday in, in order to be ready for today. And so apologies for that. Hopefully, Ian, that might answer your question. So we will get to it, but it will be next week. Yeah, thank you. I guess just as a, uh, if Eti, and we should note that when we have the financial account signed off as part of the process, the only key risk that was provided by KPMG was around the future plan. So that feeds into the back conversation as well. Berenice. Thank you, Helen. It, it, it was just to um, add and respond to some of the questions that have been raised. We, we are doing a, a piece of work across the system, which is um, almost classified as inflow, flow, outflow. And against each of those areas, we're, about, we're identifying the pieces of work that's taken place and projects that's right across the system, the risk stratification and the monitoring process. And that still isn't pulled together completely. That has been requested through the senior leadership team. So that will be able to back into our board so you'll be able to see um, what impact it's having and, and also to Hal's point about the, the ICB holding other providers to account for delivery of some of the things that we need to do as, a, as an organisation. And, and just finally, just to highlight and put in the uh, chat there, that we, we are trying to right size things at, across the board. So there are pieces of work where it will have to slow down some of our procedures. So endoscopy, for instance, we're doing really well on that. But to support UHDB, there may be some activity transferring across again, a bit like we did with 104-week weights, um, so that we, we, we get a system approach to some of these pieces of work as well. So it adds further complexity to what we're trying to deliver as an organisation. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I think that conversation was necessarily long. Um, I think we had identified a number of actions the last time I attempted to summarise, which I won't repeat, but I do think we need to add the actions that both Hal and Keith have offered to lead on with regard to the review of the BAF risks, please. Now, I wouldn't mind taking stock before we move on. It's quarter to 11. Uh, we've been going for an hour and a quarter and we've two hours left and we have a very substantive agenda which mustn't be rushed but I would ask executive colleagues insofar as papers are clear and speak for themselves that in your introduction you just bring out um, what it is you want the board to attend to in the discussion or anything that has changed since you've had a chance to go pen to paper in the interest of maximising time for us to have some discussion, please. Um, so moving on, um, we've now at item five, which is the um, uh, nursing establishment paper. The um, floor is yours, Krishna. Thank you very much. I'd just like, if the paper is actually being written by Sarah Ward, um, so I'd like her to talk us through the, the main points of the paper for us to then end into a um, wider discussion about it. As you'll uh, recall, Sarah is a NHSE um, safe staffing fellow, and as such, she's, you know, it's a really robust methodology that, we, that she has used to actually pull the papers together. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, all. Good thank, morning, you. thank you. There's, there's an echo in the room, so I apologise. Um, for those that don't know you, I'm uh, Sarah Ward, Deputy Chief of Nursing. And as Krishna alluded to, um, last year I undertook an NHSC Safer Staffing Faculty Fellowship um, and remain part of that faculty, which is brilliant for us as an organisation because it enables us access to additional resources and support to ensure that we have um, really robust opportunities to consider our establishment. So for the first time in a couple of years, um, we have been able to conduct an in-depth census of our patient acuity based on the most normal normal off periods that we've had in the last two years with elective activity coming back on site 
um, and in a, in a more balanced position than we have been. So whilst we conducted robust assurance throughout the pandemic on a daily basis, we've been able to fulfil the census in its more traditional sense. So that is assessing every patient every day for 20 days to against set criteria to understand the nursing requirement for safe care against that. So the paper sets out that methodology um, and the requirement of all the aspects that have to be considered as part of that review. Um, and uh, the, the key bits that I will pull out from there are around our um, improved position from a care hours per patient day. Um, for those of you who will recall, Lord Carter set that out in his report as a proxy measure for, um, as a broad measure for quality against care to benchmark other organisations. So this data is pulled from model hospitals so we can see our position nationally there. And we're sat to the upper upper part of the midpoint. Um, and that is an improved position from uh, at the end of the year last year where we were um, in the lower quartile. So um, that's a positive and that is largely augmented by temporary staffing over different waves of the pandemic. Um, then there's a, just to note the um, what we've looked at from one aspect of data is our health roster extract. We've looked at the actual required hours against um, our patient census um, versus what we're actually delivering. And you'll see in um, section 2.4.2, the graph will show um, a broad um, gap consistently um, of an hour uh, or so each day in terms of care hours um, not fulfilled. However, um, that is one look. So you then go further to have a deeper look and how and we mitigate those on a daily basis by um, pulling our ward leaders to work clinically, etc. So whilst that's what our health roster will tell us, that's one one aspect. We do fulfil the requirement one to eight um, and we can give good assurance against the fulfilment of that. And we have lots of opportunities to look at our quality through a number of metrics, including the restarting of the ward accreditation programme. Not um, something I really wanted to pull out was our lived experience of our staff, however, um, what they what they're telling us on a daily basis. So we are providing assurance against we are mitigating our risk on a daily basis. We have robust processes, but our staff are really tired and um, and it's it's not um, inconsequential, the impact upon them on a daily basis. What the acuity census has shown us clearly this time is our patients are more sick and they are more dependent. And there is a clear incremental rise in that acuity and dependency. And some of that is around deconditioning and even our elective patients, they've waited longer, so they're not as fit as they were coming in previously. So um, this incremental rise is consistent and, and it hasn't um, dipped at all. We have good um, workforce develop development. Our essential training is is in a in a relatively positive position, despite the fact that we have at times had to pull our staff from that training at times of clinical demand, um, and that's always a very difficult balance and a difficult position um, to prioritise one against the other. As you'll see from the attraction and recruitment section, our overseas recruitment has been very successful with a total of 108 over the last two um, international trained nurses over the last two years. Um, and they, they've been a real success story for us. And I think are creating a real um, sense of integration in our in our hospital staffing. Newly qualified nurses this year is a slight dip from years before, and we're expecting a approximately 60 to join us later in the year. And that then leads us on to um, a pictorial um, position of our registered nurses against um, budget, against actual but the gap. So when I talk about lived experience, if you um, refer to the graph on page 8.1, on page 7, 8.2.1. This gap really gives us a bit more of what our staff are telling us. So we have contracted whole time equivalent, which is the red. We have our budgeted whole time equivalent as the blue. But what the staff that are actually available to roster are in green. So that gap is created by a mixture of some vacancy, some 
and you at some is sick long-term sickness considerable amount of maternity leave um, and and that's the lived experience that our staff are describing so our availability to roster is really um, is, is much reduced we we use temporary staffing to augment on a daily basis and you'll see from the temporary staffing um, graph that we are considerably under plan so um, whilst we um, manage this and mitigate the risk on a daily basis actually we are performing well against our agency planning uh, agency reduction plan um, that's not that's notwithstanding the fact that this is a considerable cost each month um, and in june alone that was nine hundred thousand um, pounds which is a considerable figure we then looked divisionally around what we could do and um, and each ward we went through carefully. We looked at the census, we looked at the risk profile and we drew the recommendations from that. So in summary, we have um, come to what you will find on Appendix 1 is the adult wards, um, ED to note is not included in this review. The Safer Nursing Care Tool for ED was published earlier in the year and we have only just completed the census for that. So we're now in the data analysis process, um, but that wasn't in a position. The work is further ongoing with um, the urgent and emergency care development to ensure that that census supports the planning for the staffing for that part of our services. So this is our largely our adult inpatient wards and the recommendations against each of those. And you'll see largely whilst there there are fairly modest uplifts suggested, it is not insignificant in terms of an overall um, estimated cost. The primary recommendation is around developing a um, enhanced leadership model and we've seen a proof of concept on that in one of our medical wards and one of our surgical wards which were historically difficult to recruit to um, and difficult to staff some of our most dependent areas so Ashover our elderly care and dementia facility and Robinson as our um, fractured neck femur orthopaedic ward so very dependent areas very difficult to recruit to historically um, and both currently have minimal vacancies based on the enhanced leadership model that we've put in with additional band six award sister um, level that has not only supported more junior workforce to develop and bring on it has supported retention and it has supported that recruitment staff are can see a clear development plan for them and clear opportunities and enhanced opportunities what it also does is support um, operational flow because our band sixes are by virtue experienced nurses who can challenge discharges, who can support um, some of those more difficult conversations. Um, so that that is really um, helping those those areas. So that was our key recommendation for uplifts of band sixes. And then there were small um, but fairly modest based on the acuity uplifts to registered nurse vacancies and registered nurse establishment and then um, additional HCAs and that is based on the increased acuity and dependency of these patients and the risk profile so to support our falls risk our pressure ulcer prevention the work that we need to do around nutrition hydration all of those essential care elements um, to enhance those those ward healthcare support workers. So I will pause at that point um, and over to any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, very comprehensive. Um, just, just to clarify, so this, this excludes ED, sort of theatres and maternity um, working, so it's our base ward um, and looking at their establishment. And also one of the important things is from based on our staff survey, one of our biggest risks is about the retention of our staff. And the one of the questions about um, that has seen an increase sort of nationally and certainly locally is about possibility of, of leaving within the next 12 months. So the leadership is really important to provide that, that support for our teams, but actually fits with some of the, the people agenda about trying to support people and to offer that development pathway so that you know we retain 
and, and be that choice of, uh, of employer. We have a really good track record and we've still got a really good record of, of our students having an excellent experience and wanting to join us. And our biggest time, you know, is with all universities, is really the September, October is our biggest. So we've already got a number of, of colleagues in, in the pipeline to start with us. And we're doing some additional, um, uh, I think it's sort of in the next few weeks or so at Chesterfield uh, ground again to, to look at some open days about sort of future pipeline of, of, of staff coming in. But it's really important that we that we do this because that potentially is a, is a huge risk for us going forward. So that would only widen the gap that we're currently seeing and that would impact on the care and safety of patients. Okay, so again, in the interest of time, if I can focus us back on the paper, and the paper gives us a recommendation for um, employing more colleagues on a full-time basis in the trust in order to address gaps and the gap in reality between the establishment and feet on the ground, and we're assured that the costs are broadly neutral. Um, so, and we've had a further addition from Krishna that we would need to look in the, in the similar vein at a similar approach across at least three further areas, theatres, ED and maternity. So if we could focus our conversation on that um, central recommendation now, I will be grateful. Uh, Paul. Thank you, Helen. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah and Krishna, for that um, report and, and overview. I didn't get a feel for how what you call the trajectory um, approach will work. What does that mean in reality? And what new and innovative things will come into play? Because what you basically said is we can't recruit staff because there's a shortage of staff. And yet the recommendation is to increase staff. So, so what is going to change to be able to get the staff that we say the problem is, I kind of don't understand what it is we're going to do new, innovatively, to get this pool of staff that we say we can't get because there is no staff. And how does that then link into the trajectory? So if you could just give me some more explanation of that, because I, I, maybe I'm being a bit dim, but I really don't understand what it means. OK. Thanks, Paul. Thank Let you. Me take that, then I come to Nora. Sarah, all yours. Thank you. Um, no, no, it's um, because I live and breathe this every day, so I understand it. Um, to, sorry, the next one. Is me speaking or not? Um, so, with the enhanced leadership, what we see in those difficult to recruit areas is that um, people want to go and work there because they know they will be supported and developed. So we actually don't struggle to recruit as such. We have a consistent pipeline of staff coming through, um, approximately 15 a month of experienced nurses coming through to be interested to work here. What the enhanced leadership does is make us a, an even more attractive employer because our staff want to stay where they're being developed and they can see a development route through. That makes sense. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not. Not really, because you say that people are leaving, and the and the and the amount that we require for um, temporary staff um, and agency staff is increased. So, so I kind of don't understand. We might have people coming in, but but when you take a look at the totality, something doesn't stack up. So so, so what I don't get from your presentation and the recommendation is. How does the trajectory work and what is the trajectory to actually deal with the problem other than um, we want to recruit more staff? So I don't kind of get a feel that the numbers themselves that you're suggesting deals with the problem that we've got. I think so, I'd like to come in just to give her a second if we could, yeah. So thank, so th thank you, Paul. Um, I think for me, it's been that employer. There are there are people out there who are qualifying. It's been that employer of choice, and what we're, what we're saying is we've got a good track record. The concern about people leaving is about from the staff survey asking in the next twelve months. There potentially could be a huge exodus, and and that would further impact. So it's stopping not stopping people leaving, but offering different development opportunities so that people don't leave and don't sort of widen that gap. Of people coming in and people going out. 
if that makes sense. What we have done over the past is, is it, um, highlighted in the report, and that's our overseas nurses, and that has really bolstered us as an organisation of getting, and we heard that, we, I'm not sure if you were present, but we heard that staff story. So Siraj gave his, his staff story earlier, has actually got 10 years experience out in India before he came here, but like, you know, these are experienced, kind and compassionate people we want to attract in. Now we've got a number of staff who are still in that process of, you know, some, some of our colleagues, international colleagues, have only just started, but it's that support and they will translate into the um, registered nurse figures as well. So it's, it's, it's offering that whole rounded package. Of, you know, we need to be an employer of choice and what we have seen is um, in NHS um, organisations locally, uh, we, we've seen an increase in experienced staff wanting to come and work with us and we need to capitalise on that and make it as a, as a consistent that we get more staff to come. And I know we've, we've had a conversation previously about um, we're just moving moving the, the chairs around, if you like, but actually for us and, and our patients and keeping our focus on that patient safety, it's actually imperative that we, that we do that. Does that answer what you're saying, Paul? I'm not well, sure. I'm not sure we can play ping pong. We can't play ping pong. I don't think it does answer your question, yeah. Paul. I suspect it won't answer your question to your satisfaction. I'm not sure we're going to answer it today. Mm -hmm. And we've got an orderly queue of Nora, Jane, and Jeremy. So I think we'll have to note the uh, the, the concern. Nora, um, good paper. Quick question on productivity and modelling. Um, you identified the number of um, registered nurses that are um, there's a shortage of. But when I've gone round the wards, one of the key things that nurses have said is the time that they take on paperwork. If I'm wondering if you've looked at the, um, the, the makeup of teams um, to perhaps look at a lower cost admin person uh, being employed as part of the team to free up more the staffing time. Okay, I'll keep that one if you would, um, Sarah and Krishna. Uh, Jane? I just wanted to offer a little insight to Paul. Um, um, having done an award visit recently with Sarah, and we were talking about, we were talking about the number of sisters, so band six grades on the ward, and about career progression with the staff. And actually, what some of those staff were saying, the more junior qualified staff, is that they really do need and value that band six support because they're being asked to do more and more complex procedures as well as actually. The, the kind of uh, sheer workload from numbers of patients so it's about complexity and it's about support so I think one of the things that Sarah is trying to talk about is about a proper career progression and actually daily support of staff and I think you know if you go to the wards where that is already happening you can you can feel and see the difference that it makes to the attitude of staff so on the one hand it's about daily support but on the other hand, it's about clear progression within our hospital. We've got more leadership roles and people can see that there is a future for them within our, within our structure. Thank you. Thank you. Jeremy? Uh, yes, th th thank you, Sarah, for the, the paper. Um, one thing I wanted to pull out was the discrepancy between different wards in terms of the position. I, I did a ward visit with Hal recently to Durham Ward and I was very struck by the high level of vacancies on Durham, which actually is borne out in the table here, where 40% of registered posts are uh, unfilled. And how, how they manage to keep things going with such a high level of vacancy, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so will, in, in addressing this problem, are you going to prioritise those wards that have got a more severe problem first and move on to the less severe problems later? Because they're not all the same. Okay. Yes, of course. I just want to say it's a great paper, and um, I think the detail in here is really comforting. I fully support what you are asking for, and I just want to flag the fact that I don't know how we're going to afford it, but I assume that's all part of the thing. And I think we, um, from a board perspective, I think the diligence of the work that's been done and, and the request that you're making, I fully support it. Thank you. Um, I don't think I've heard anybody not fully support it, and I think the um, evidence-based uh, approach you've taken to putting the case um, so clearly, uh, Sarah, has been enormously helpful, and thank you for that. Um, 
And I think the issues about finance, um, particularly with the um, broad indication that they'd be largely neutral, are probably a secondary consideration to some of the other issues that we've flagged up about where are these staff and what is their availability and how soon might we have them in place short of knitting them. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've had some interesting insights into what are the other features of a good working environment that might help us get to that place. But as Paul has helpfully put in the chat, I think some further explanation of that for colleagues will be helpful, please. And also if we could have some regular monitoring about how successful we're being having now committed to this. And if we could ask you to come back um, at your earliest convenience uh, with a similar proposition around theatres, ED and maternity, having evidence what the needs are there, that will be really good. So thank you all very much and um, we're going to draw a line onto that particular item and uh, going to move on to a not dissimilar uh, but different discussion about the situation with regard to medical staffing and the Chief Executive has been very good value today moonlighting for the Medical Director who is on leave. Very good, yes. Um, so, so thank you. Um, I think this we should take this paper largely as read and it's in a lot in a, to an extent for noting because there isn't a specific request about extra funding for example here but it's to give everyone a, a view of the current position um, and some of the challenges that that is faced around both wider medical staffing but but also specifically around consultant staffing um, the, the only thing I would comment on and it comes back a little bit to the nursing situation is that in some areas we've done consultant staffing really well compared to other peers and it's often involved us being quite proactive in the way we deal with consultant gaps so as an example within our intensive care unit we are just about fully staffed with um, our intensive care consultants whereas in Doncaster which is just down the road they're currently running with three intensive care units three substantive consultants compared to an establishment of 10 people. Now that puts great clinical risk but also great cost as well because of the need to be filling in um, with agency staff to keep that service going and so it's just that request I suppose from the board that where we can be sensibly proactive in recruitment and even if in the very short term that might mean being over established by half a consultant at whole time equivalent for a 12 month period pending someone's retirement that's a much better way of keeping us safe as an organization and in the long term I think controlling costs so it's just to bring that that kind of the benefits of being proactive out but otherwise the paper happy to take questions but but to take as as read and as i understand that there's nothing being escalated to the board in terms of risks or issues because you're content with the mitigation that's in place or that you're putting us on notice that you might seek to over in, recruit indeed by way of further mitigation yeah, indeed so, thank I, you no specific over recruitment but just a plea that we can remain flexible in individual areas where we can usefully do do that as an exec team. Very good. Um, comments, questions for Hal on the paper. Sue? Just one question. On the summary, the final paragraph says review of the, the trust clinical strategy within the next few will identify areas. I don't know whether it means days, weeks, or months. And it's quite hard. <laughs> <laughs> it is an apology from Kevin. He missed it. I missed that word. Sorry, I didn't mean to come to I think still in the time period. Yeah. Choice. <laughs> I think the, the, the trust strategy that we're talking about um, is partly the subsequent paper, but it's, it's also part of our existing clinical strategy, but it does link into whether there are certain areas where as a so for example as an ICS we should be saying well uh, you know max facts shouldn't be something that we manage here in Chesterfield alone we should do that on a Derbyshire wide basis and then that's obviously impacts on our staffing models so it's a reference to that rather than a specific ask now it's that ongoing process is, is what I understand. Probably insert the correct word in there for the record this month. We, the months is the, the word that we should we should be having there. Thanks, Sue. Um, taking over from Jeremy as Hawkeye. <laughs> um, Paul. Thank, 
Thank you, Hal. Um, it, it, it's both to the last report and this report. It's a bit of a left field question, but what I want to ask. What are the most radical options which are different that could be looked at, um, which may not have been looked at at the moment? And you won't be able to answer this, which could deal with some of the problems we've got. You know, it's, um, it's a strange question, but I sit here kind of thinking, what are the radical options and changes that could happen to help extra to solve these problems that maybe to date have been put to one side or thought maybe you wouldn't get the investment or the too difficult. Would that be a helpful process to come back with? So I, I think the brief answer is that we already are doing quite a lot of radical options around workforce. And what I mean by that is, for example, um, in nursing, around nursing associate posts and training those people up, around in our non-medical workforce, around people such as ACPs, physician associates, and that applies in rural primary care to a, a significant degree as well, as well as within the hospital. So our kind of um, workforce delivery group frequently looks at those alternative medical people, alternatives to medics or alternative to nurses, and we already have a lot of those people in place and working on the, on the ground as part of an ongoing plan. Now, I'm sure there is more that we can do, but it, I think it's not, a, it's not a sudden change in our actions. We're doing lots of this already and continuing to develop it. If there are some other um, completely different approaches that you're aware of, I'd be, I'd be happy to, to do that. But I think actually we're quite at the forefront of a lot of those things with a lot of the work that Maxine Simmons has done previously around different workforce models and Mike Scanlon um, from a medical point of view. So we are doing lots of that already. I don't know, Jeremy, if you'd like to comment with your People Committee chair hat on. Uh, yes, I'm happy to. Um, we've, we've had a lot of discussion over the years, Paul, about different, particularly around the nursing models. And Lynn, um, Lynn Andrews, when she was chief nurse here, was very keen on pushing new models of, of nursing care. Um, and at the, uh, at the People Committee, we keep an eye on the, the um, development of new, um, I'm trying to, new professional roles within the system. So I absolutely back to Hal up in saying that an awful lot of quite um, radical thinking has gone on already. Um, of course, you don't know what you don't know. And if, you know, if there are other radical thoughts out there that other people are having that we've not had yet, then we need to find a way of bringing those to our attention. But there is, there is quite a lot of going that has gone on already, particularly on the nursing front, I think. In response to this challenge, could I make a suggestion? The first is that the work you've described takes place at the People Committee is extended to embrace the point Nora made on the last item, which was about um, the adequacy of the administrative support to the medical or nursing model by way of thinking about the whole team beyond clinical roles. And also to Paul's point about specifically looking at where there might be some innovation or really good practice elsewhere by way of stimulating um, kind of, are we being um, as imaginative as we might be around all of this? Would you be happy to do that, Jeremy? I think that was a nod. Yes. Thank you, Jeremy. For the record. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Berenice. Thanks, Helen. I, th I think this is a really helpful discussion because it does play into uh, Steve and I's point before around the transformation work and looking at alternative roles and we've got a lot more development to do at um, Chesterfield Royal uh, around alternative practitioners that could really support both where we are with consultants and where we want to be um, with delivering services so I think that's really helpful to link into that piece of work thank you. Thanks Berenice. Um, in which case I think we note this report and the actions um, Jeremy has kindly taken on the back of it. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we're going to do maternity continuity of care and then we're going to take a very short break before we go on to the next uh, batch of items.
Um, so, Krishna, all yours. Thank you. Just like to say, um, just take the paper as read. Um, apologies, really, for the timing of the paper. We were under sort of, you know, we paused Constituti Carer um, nationally, uh, extending it to just before Christmas, and then there was a quite a, a small time frame where we needed to submit plans for extending the whole of Continuity of Carer. Um, and it needed a submission by the 15th, so apologies that we needed to take um, and have a provision under our sort of our sort of board standing orders to be able to, to, to do that and to meet our obligation to submit the plan. In essence, I'll take the paper as read, but the, the recommendation is that we currently have one team and there is increased pressure um, nationally to even stop and pause continuity of care and we're really loath to do that. It's an established team offering really good um, care for the most disadvantaged um, mums to be in, in, a, a, in a sort of very um, small location and it's accounting for about sort of eight or nine percent of our total births managed through that small team but it's offering you know all the best outcomes for women in that model of care. So we do not envisage um, standing that down, but equally, we cannot see that we will have that incremental increase in our continuity of care provision without external funding to do that. And that we also, with a caveat, is, and that will come back to, to Helen's point about the paper from a maternity point of view, we are already seeing our birth numbers increasing um, and the acuity of our mums increasing and with that will also come additional challenge on our existing um, establishment. So we do not see that we, we we wouldn't be able to do this further modelling and going through sort of the next sort of five years really to recruit up to the um, full number of teams with our external funding. Um, and, and that's what we have submitted to NHSAI and we're awaiting sort of further feedback on, on the, that paper. So we're not going to make changes to the current arrangements, but not anticipating and going beyond them at the moment yeah. because of other constraints. Yes, that's right. And that has been submitted. Jeremy. Sorry, can I, can I just ask for clarification there? My understanding was that the, the national position was that we should be rolling this out as quickly as possible. You just said, if I heard you right, that actually they're expecting us to draw back. So which is it, or do they speak with different voices at different times? The latter. Okay. <laughs> That's never happened before. So the, so the decision we took as a board, uh, I don't know, two weeks ago, um, you're bringing back to us now because of the change in requirements nationally. No, 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 no. There, there is there is conflicting. The, we were all, we should all be sat here thinking that this is the right thing to do for women and having it rolled out. Absolutely, but by doing that, you have a shift in in movement of midwives. So that's changed in work-life balance, and it's a massive different commitment to do that. It, and it's, you know, we're still at the st steady stage of, of sort of one team, and we're holding on dearly to that one team. Ideally for mums and babies and outcomes, we would want to roll that out to a full model, but it will need increase in the number of midwives to be able to affect that change. And we, we're not in that position, and we are not alone um, as a system, we've, we've um, agreed that that is the stance across the system and actually regionally we're not out of kilter and in, you know, we had three stay the same, roll back or fully implement and we've gone stay the same. Yeah. But a lot of places have had to roll back because of the um, pulling the midwives from doing the continuity care model back into because of, the, because of the huge gaps in midwives. In their birth and am I right that the national position is that they originally said we should be rolling this out and now they're saying uh, not so fast? Yeah, I think okay. there, there is that appreciation that it will take uh, winning of more hearts and minds to do that and more people to do that as well. And there is the, the change in acuity of women has changed quite considerably during COVID and that has to play into the, the safety aspect for, for women. And I think that that is a, it's not a pause as such, but we've, we've said we want to keep our team. They're doing a really good job getting fantastic yeah. feedback, but we can't support that rollout anymore without additional um, funding of, of additional requirements. Wouldn't be safe to do so. Okay. 
So, uh, Jane, before we ask colleagues if they're content to support the, uh, the approach set out in the paper, can I ask if there's anything you want to add from, I know what I've been, um, long discussions at Quality Assurance Committee about this issue? Um, I think just to see what uh, given three options, we don't want to roll back on our position because actually um, the outcomes for mums and babies are particularly good using this model. It is in, in effect practising in one of our most deprived areas and so it absolutely it would be a last resort for us to be thinking about rolling back. So we have put in the steady state. Um, if we could increase it, then that would be absolutely fantastic and we have got a plan to do that. But it would require extra staffing, it would require extra extra funding. And actually, at the moment, as Krishna says, we've got increasing numbers of mums um, booking with us and increasing numbers of those mums require actually consultant led care through the unit. So we cannot deplete our birth centre in favour of the continuity of care model. So it is a balance that we have to find uh, in submitting the paper. Also, we put, did put in a caveat to say, yeah, you, you know, we can um, submit a trajectory, but also it is subject to there being no other safety priorities that come up from maternity that require our investment. So uh, even that submission has been caveated, as you can see. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, and it's nice to have the assurance that the Quality Assurance Committee have specifically bent their minds to the issue about whether even continuing with the as-is model is posing a greater risk in the context of services in the birth centre. And to hear that you're um, satisfied that this represents the right balance of risk, I think is an important factor for us to be aware of in um, considering the, uh, uh, the recommendation today. Are colleagues content to agree the recommendation? Yes. 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 Very good. Thank you very much. So we're now at the point of the on the agenda of going to the next section of papers, which are about vision and strategy. And the next paper is about progress against the trust strategy refresh, uh, which follows on from a board development day we had a few weeks ago. So, um, Hal. Um, so, so thank you. Um, Again, I, I take the paper as, as read that the two summary bits, I suppose, are a reflection on where we were last year and how we performed against what we wish to do as regarding our strategy and what our aims were for that, and a recognition that an awful lot of the things that we set ourselves out to do, in reality, we didn't achieve, which was very largely due to covid and the changing circumstances over the year. So that's the, the first bit, and the, those bits of strategy and the, the core bits of that that we set out back in 2021 remain exactly the same as before, so our aspirations and, and the, the, the high-level aims behind that remain the same. And then the second bit is regarding, um, which follows on from the, the board development day in June, and it's regarding a, a way of us as a board having a regular oversight of certain high level metrics that we can use as a way of monitoring the overall health of the organisation in those areas without having to drill down into every single um, bit underneath that with the expectation that the board subcommittees will be looking at each of those areas in more detail, but that we as a board have a high level oversight of the whole picture, if that makes sense. And that these, the suggested markers, which have been suggested by individual exec colleagues as, a, as an indicator, if you'd like, of the health of their area, would be used as a way of monitoring that on a, on a regular basis. So that's the, that's the premise behind it. But I think actually what, what we need to do here is to hear people's views and to discuss it rather than me talking to everyone and saying what, what we've come up with. But this is, in summary, what we as an exec team have come up with as suitable things to, to be aware of from a board point of view. So it's really about the board stewardship of a small number of metrics that are sufficiently indicative of the health of the organisation and a wider number of facets that the recommendation is that we would particularly focus on these. Exactly. And by corollary, the, um, 
be um, happy to delegate the more detailed work that would sit under each and any of them to committees on the basis that it will get escalated back to the board through committee reports in respect to the IPR. Indeed. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, I'd like to take this discussion in two parts. Um, I'd like the first part to be about um, the kind of signing off, if you like, of the um, update about what has been. Um, so, if, because I imagine most people want to talk about what is to come, but for good order, I would just like to focus on that first. Does anybody want to come in on um, the kind of review of the uh, of the objectives we have been working to? Is your hand up on this one? No. Okay. So, okay. Jeremy. Sorry, when, when you say the objectives we have been working to, do you, do you include that these proposed new measures? No. So, okay. No, this was last year's last objective, year. because no, we set some specific objectives Thanks. last year. Because yes. I think it's really important that they get signed off. I'm yeah. not suggesting for a moment there's any new news here. We look at them on board. Mm. We have a constant diet of them at Council of Governors through looking at the success criteria. I'm not suggesting there's anything novel or contentious, but I think for good order, it's important that the board acknowledges and agrees and signs off those. So I will uh, take it to everyone's content. Looking to the proposal for the for the next year, if you like, um, I can see that there's a number of hands. Um, so I've got Nora, please, then I go to Berenice, Jeremy and Ian. Um, it was really just a point of clarification, so um, the objectives that you've listed there, mm -hmm. if we were looking at a series of metrics, some of these are national staff surveys, but how often do they take place? Because if it's only once a year, then actually that doesn't give us the capability to, to flex. And if we say that it's recommending the trust as a place to work, one of the things that we do keep coming back to is culture. Um, and, um, and so I just wondered if there were sort of subsets of the, um, the objectives. But perhaps listen to the other. Let's, yeah, let's take them in the round. That's, that's, that's very helpful. Um, thank you, Nora. Um, Berenice, please. So, so I, I just wanted to, to add, um, Helen, that this, this list as well is some suggestions of some high level metrics. So really, I think it'd be really helpful to get some feedback if we're, we're capturing the, the right things um, and, and interested to hear from the non-exec directors. Because sometimes it's quite hard to, to set those those high level metrics. Um, and just to, to kind of Nora's point, there are there will be a huge amount of metrics that sit underneath that um, that don't all necessarily inform that one metric. If I take RPC, for instance, um, but that that is a key one that we we think that we need to look at. Um, we we will look to do local surveys as well as um, wait for some of the national work that needs to happen because you're right some of it isn't regular enough uh, so there will be some local support that's put in place and I'm thinking specifically around that one. Thanks Helen. The boardroom's on mute. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so observation, only one of these six, uh, eight measures is a measure of quality of care, and that's the hospital mortality indicator, which is a pretty crude measure. Now, I'm, I'm aware that it's really challenging to identify single measures of quality of care across the whole organization um, but I just so I just make that as an observation um, a couple of questions one is um, is there a danger that some of these will build in perverse incentives and uh, and and lead us to um, hitting the target but missing the point um, so that for example with the 12 hour wait target if if we got that down to zero, but at the cost of making everybody else pay 11 and a half hours, we wouldn't have been doing well. So how are we going to guard against those kind of um, inadvertently adverse consequences emerging? And then the, the second question is, um, I observe that all but the ACE measure are pretty objective measures, but I, 
it may just be my understanding of the ACE measure. Is that is that an objective measure, or is that potentially one that the subjective judgment of our own teams will lead to improvements without there being an objective improvement? There are helpful comments. Uh, in fact, I'm going to go next, not in my capacity as uh, you know, keeping the conversation flowing, but in some particular observations of myself. They link to Jeremy's. Um, I couldn't live with these as they're currently expressed without the addition of something about patient experience. I know customer is a dirty word, but we have got customers and they're called patients. And we've got a wider set of customers that are called the population. Um, so I think there's something we're going to have to capture about customer experience in the same way that we're capturing staff experience. And if we had something about customer experience as well as staff experience, I will be probably to Nora's earlier point, happy to accept those as a proxy of culture. And the other one that I can't frankly live without is, um, I'd be delighted to know that we weren't killing people, but I'd be much more interested in knowing about quality clinical outcomes. And there's nothing here, and we had a huge discussion at our away day about quality clinical outcomes. And we went around in some circles about what we were only going to look at stroke and what we were going to look at maternity and we were going to look at surgical specialties or what we were going to look at a much wider group of benchmarks of clinical outcomes. But we're here not to provide an adequate service. We're here to provide as good a service as anybody might get anywhere else, including against the best possible benchmarks available to us. And I really think that needs embedding in this. Um, so I'd offer those as bills on Jeremy's observations. Ian. Okay, thank you. Uh, you've uh, taken, you said most of what I intended to say. So I had things around customer and outcomes. Um, so I'd be highly supportive of that. I guess the one thing I would say is just be careful we don't measure things too regularly. Because um, I think that's why we don't do very well on BAS, which are measure them too regularly. Um, and possibly back to our conversation earlier in this um, board meeting, I do think we have to do something around system because actually outcomes and customer is about an end-to-end -end experience. Um, I, know, I know that's not very helpful. I'm not giving you a measure, but I do think we have to have something that brings us with the system. Thanks, Ian. Jane. I want to just speak specifically to um, Jimmy and the ACE one and uh, not have been part of the board conversation. So I think it's about what happens the so on the ACE and just the question about the objective, of course we've got this same system where we have our data things against um, all sorts of different measures, so from falls to all sorts of things. So we can look on one single computerised system, digital system, and we can say this is what is happening on this unit on this particular day. These are the things that uh, metrics that are out of kill to blah, blah, blah. So I think the ACE thing is actually more objective than perhaps we have been uh, using it as such previously. But I think it's, it is also therefore also about what underpins that. So the things what are the lists of things that the quality committee, for example, is going to focus on in respect of that one objective? So previously we will have used the quality strategy, which is a long time since it's been refreshed. So I, I just I just want I'm just interested to know how we build it for the assurance committee. So Shimmy, I would say, is the same. So I think that's I think that's fine. But actually underpinning it are all of the other clinical effectiveness. I'll put them into that that bad term as clinical effectiveness measures. So things like peer reviews, GERFD, audit, all that sort of stuff. So I think it's about what you're building through the assurance committees to give the assurance into these overarching metrics. So that, I think, is a, is a board and a committee conversation, but I think those are the critical factors for me. Thank you, Helen. That's all. Um, it's a bit parallel to what Jeremy said about perverse incentives. I'd like to understand a bit more about how this sits with the IPR, the Integrated Performance Report. Um, I think there's a danger if we only look at very high level stuff, there may be something that, so I'm not saying that we should you know, constantly look at the detail of the IPR, but I think we need to understand how the two link together and what's going to be covered where and what's going to be covered where. Thank you. 
which is a really helpful build on Jane's point about what is the assurance framework that goes around this on the full suite of metrics that feed into the top level board metrics, which, which really should be functioning as something of a balanced scorecard. Yeah, thank you for that at all. Um, Paul. Thank you, Helen. Thank you for the report. Really good. Um, I want to reiterate what Helen said. I, I do think there has to be something about clinical outcomes um, and it does allude slightly to what Ian said as well. That's not just as that is system thinking as well. The the other two things I would kind of play back. One is I'd want to see something about health inequalities in there. Um, um, I'm not quite sure what, but I think health inequalities must drive us, and I think it's important, particularly when you think some of the communities that we serve. Um, and the, the other one is, it's kind of a, a flip of the customer satisfaction survey. One of the high level things that I've seen works well in other organisations is not the satisfaction, but a very simple question, which you wonder is what could we do better? Because that actually then focuses you on actually changing things rather than just looking at what, what works well. So maybe just kind of looking at that, but flipping it to find out what we can do better. Um, and it, it, it gives us a focus then from the perspective of the user, the customer, to use Helen's word, which drives into what we may need to look at. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I went back to the output from our board development day, actually, and I think we had listed patient experience was number one, so just to reinforce that I completely agree with that. Uh, and staff experience, we did we did say including leadership, because that was about the cultural point, recognising that's where culture sort of lives, isn't it? And then I think some of these might be intended to be embedded, um, how they, what, what's in here, so that could be for later detail. We were quite keen to understand our transformation of digital targets, which may well be in the finance as well. We also talked about, and, and I really thought about it this morning when we had the lovely uh, uh, patient story, staff story, about how do we monitor being a learning organisation. I think that's going to be even more important as transformation is our only hope of ever achieving our financial position. Um, is that how we do that? I'm not suggesting that's easy, by the way, but we did talk about that quite a lot at that board day. Appreciate you up there. Um, and then the other thing that came up on the board day, and you Paul was right, we also mentioned health inequalities in the in the context of end to end patient pathways. And the other thing that came up, which I think was particularly at all was talking about, but uh, was about the good environment, because this was about the capital. Um, ability to create good environments, you know, the, the, the comparison between really lovely wards and less lovely wards and how do we create that good environment, being very conscious of the impact of environment on patient wellbeing. So, I mean, I'm reiterating what was in the, the stuff of the day, but I think it's really, really, but also should say well done to get into here because this is yeah. a huge, vast improvement um, of where we were and I'm really pleased to see that we've got the right focus on it, but hopefully can take what we were saying in the spirit of builds and happy to help uh, with any more outside the room if I can. Excellent. So let me try and draw the threads together if I can then. Um, I'd like to reiterate Sue's thanks. Uh, we've managed, I think, to do quite a bit of work on strategy refresh that involved no bean bags or flip charts or post-it notes, just some quality, pithy, uh, fairly rapid discussions on the basis that we understand the business that is we're charged with um, looking after. And um, I think it's really helpful to have this back the way we have, have so thank you. Um, I think in terms of the substance of what's in front of us, there's an issue about customer and customer expresses itself both as patient and patient experience and population, which is probably where health and equality sit. And then there's something about clinical outcomes. Um, I think the other items that have been mentioned are all very important and need to be faithfully followed through from the day, but I think they're possibly input measures rather than outcome measures. And I think we're now fairly close to a small set of top line board level metrics with the additions we've requested that will help us keep our eye and give proper stewardship to the strategy. But we won't do that justice ourselves, and we certainly won't be looked in on as seem to be suitably um, 
discharging our scrutiny functions unless when this comes back to us with the additions, it also includes the assurance framework by which it is we're going to monitor the delivery of the strategy. So it's not only about reports at the appropriate intervals, avoiding perverse incentives that come back to this board, but it's also about what particular responsibilities in respect of each of these areas and the myriad of metrics that sit behind them mean for any revisions to the IPR and what it means for any specific responsibilities that are allocated with regard to IPR measures or other measures to committees. And it will need to be done on the explicit understanding that committee chairs and committee members will be very diligent and um, timely in escalating any <coughs> issues from that more detailed scrutiny of the associated metrics as opposed to the top line metrics that we as a board will take direct stewardship of. And I think, um, Hal, if we could get to the point of doing that in as, um, as, in, as, in as workmanlike, timely, clear, um, unflapping sort of way as we've got this first version of events, we would do ourselves great credit. So I hope that's not an unreasonable ask to have back at our next board meeting. No, I, I think that's absolutely fine on the patient experience one. That's just my oversight, for which I apologise, because that absolutely was something we talked about. But that's me doing a paper on Saturday before I go off on holiday and trying to get it submitted. So, um, so absolutely right on that. I think our plan was always to have this high level discussion to then each individual area and it links into the board subcommittees would be bringing a more detailed proposal or background about what would sit underneath that which would be being looked at by the board subcommittees and, and all the things the various things people talked about and how it sits with the IPR and all, and all of those things with a view to bringing that back into the board committee in September isn't it the next one because August's holiday and that we would bring a more, a more detailed one providing people were happy with this as a principle behind how we were going to do it and acknowledging that it will always be difficult to capture all of this information in just a, it's the balance between a, a small um, manageable number of things we're looking at versus the IPR for example where there's umpteen different metrics and we, we risk getting bogged down if we discuss every single bit in board so I'm happy with that and, and unless people specifically want me to answer any of those individual questions it's probably more constructive I've jotted them all down yeah. And I can take them back and we'll discuss further with execs and then we'll bring it back to September next time if, if people are happy with that approach. So I have made notes throughout of the questions, so we'll try to answer in due course. Nothing more comforting than a chief executive with a pen in their hand. So <laughs> thank you very much. My tiny <laughs> scribble, so there you go. Thank you very much. Helen, I'm aware it's very bad form to interject again after you've summed up, but um, another point that occurs to me is about our environmental impact. I, it would be really nice to have something here about that, whether it's our overall carbon footprint or whatever. But I'm happy to talk to you about that. Yeah, and it's that thing about how many things we we measure and what yes, our core is. So, yeah. so I'm happy happy to discuss. It's just that balance, isn't it? I think the other action we need to um, just note, and I know it's in train, is that these measures, after we next discuss them at board, will need to go to the nominations committee en route to the Council of Governors. This Council of Governors are very um, uh, wise in tying their success criteria to hold NEDS to account against to the, the headlines in our own strategy. And that has been the way in which the Council of Governors have done it for a number of years now. So that will need to be refreshed on the back of this. And I know John has it penciled in for nons and onward to Council of Governors, but that's another step that needs to be factored in to um, these arrangements. And actually, once we've done this, it then links. It then needs to link very clearly to our exec objectives, which again it is considered at Remco, isn't it? So it is indeed. And I think just to make sure that the Remco date for exec objectives is also on the plan about concluding this work fully and properly will be great. So thank you very much. Um, so that uh, concludes that item and brings us on to the dermatology pathway. I presume you're moonlighting again, Hal. I am, yes. Yeah, so although um, I've actually been, in my previous time as medical director, I was very involved with all of the dermatology pathway and the transformation. So I do know, I probably 
knew more about it than Kevin did in a way, but it, thanks to Kevin for pulling the paper together. Um, re really, this it, it's done as a presentation, but it's really to um, help um, colleagues to understand how we're going to be trying to do the transformation within the system. And we've talked about how vital transformation is and if we're going to make this it both make a difference to our patients, but also to make the savings we need to do. This particular pathway is a very good example of how um, we need to do things differently from our perspective in a way that was beneficial to patients and speeded up care and saved money. But weighed against that, despite our, our very good intentions about liaising with all of the relevant people and particularly primary care, how we really did come up against a very significant, very significant objections from some parts of primary care about doing this and how we need to, within the new ICS structure, work out a way of being able to be responsive and make changes in a way that doesn't become completely bogged down in circular arguments about who's responsible for what, and to reflect that at the heart of primary care subjections is to do with their perception about their own income and their own workload, and that if we change things in secondary care, they perceive, and often is true to an extent, that there are, are knock-on effects to their workload, which from their point of view needs reimbursing, and that we have a difficulty as an ICS about how we redistribute that money in a flexible and responsive way to make the transformation happen so that in a timely manner we can get some of the savings out of it, whilst as in this case, hopefully improving patient care and quality of experience. So I'm not, in the interest of time, I'm not going to suggest that we go through every slide. The slides are there for people to see. Um, but I'm very happy to take questions about the reality of transformation as opposed to the aspirations around transformation, because this really highlighted some of the... And we, through CPLG, so that's a clinical professional leadership group within the, the Derbyshire ICS, we do have a plan as to how we can deal with it going forward, but I'm forever frustrated by timeliness and um, us getting bogged down with too many committees having to discuss every single little thing that we want to change. There you are, pause. But Hi. comments, questions, welcome. Thank you, Hal. Jeremy. Um, just one question, really. I mean, I, I fully understand the rationale and, and the um, benefits of going about this. I just wonder how patients were involved in the redesign, if at all. Um, so we, so we have, because we've done this as a pilot, we have been collecting patients. So, so Luke and people in the Royal Academy who were helping to lead on the on the, the redesign have been, um, you know, getting patient information. But the the, the fundamental measure for a patient is. Their, their ability to be seen and treated in a timely manner. And at the heart of this was us going from a position where our um, wait for a first appointment in dermatology was over 20 weeks and in Derby is nearly a year to going to a point where GP sent in a letter. It was being meaningfully triaged. We were making a recommendation about their treatment. So the patient was starting on relevant treatment at the outset. And at the same time, by doing that and by deflecting some of those patients who didn't need to come into primary, uh, into secondary care for an outpatient appointment, the overall waiting list also came down as well. So those that still needed to be seen before treatment could be done, with, and I can't remember the, the dates now, but I know it had gone down below 10 weeks at one point, it may be worse again now. But on the back of this development, patients were A, getting treatment earlier, and be getting seen earlier. So it, it feels like it would be a no-brainer a bit from a patient point of view. Yes, I, I accept that. <laughs> I mean, it's all good for patients mm. from my perspective, mm. not as a dermatology patient. Yeah. 
But just as a matter of principle, it seems to me that if one's going to do service redesign, it'd be really good to involve patients from the beginning and say, you know, what's wrong with the present system? How do you think we could rebuild and so on? So you, you might well end up with exactly the same outcome. Yeah. But, but I, I, I agree, and they are collecting the information afterwards. And in a way, it does come back to the the timeliness and the resource to do some of yeah, this. Yeah, and we were, we were faced, in this particular case, we were faced with a real difficulty across Derbyshire with weights. And, you know, we could have done a whole patient consultation taking three months, or we could have cracked on and we did take the practical, we'll just yeah. crack on. Um, but you're right, uh, and they are collecting information from the patients, I believe. Paul. Yeah, Jeremy asked my question. Um, but it's just some kind of help, Hal. User-led design, where you get people involved, helps to break down some of the professional barriers when the voice of the user is actually involved. So it may help some of the problems that you experience because it does help that. So maybe my suggestion is going to be next time, maybe you involve patients and see whether it helps with some of the problems because I think the voice of the user does need to be involved. Thanks, Paul. At all. Yeah, uh, I think in terms of your intention to give us an insight into how these things happen, I think it's really, really excellent. Uh, I think one could see, I slightly had uh, Paul's earlier question about is there anything radical that could be done here, sort of clanging in my ears about it, and I would find that hard to answer that question. But also in terms of, of the patient uh, kind of thing, very early on in my tenure here, I attended some external NHS events when the system was, was beginning to be designed. And I, I was really surprised at the kind of, the, the talk that was going on was very professional terms, very kind of in language. I as an outsider found it difficult. And then I was thinking, if I was a patient, what would this mean to me? Now that may have been too early for, to involve patients. But I was very, you know, I was able to say, look, what you're talking doesn't make sense. And it did stop them to think, ooh, that's a very healthy challenge. And then partly they went on and carried on anyway. But I think there are other things you can do to have, you know, if you don't want to have dozens of patients involved at the beginning or whatever, but there are other ways to actually inject that kind of external perspective. You know, I'm not sure we'll be others and governors could be all going to help as well. Thank you, Atal. Berenice. That, thanks, Helen. Just to reiterate that we wanted to use this example very much as a, a learning opportunity. And I, I absolutely acknowledge that during COVID, we've reviewed some of the basics that we absolutely had in place, which was, sorry, I'm echoing again, aren't I? Um, which was, um, as such, making sure that the patient was involved, making sure that all our partners were involved in the developments that, that uh, and improvements that we make. Um, we, we've kind of got a bit more used to just cracking on and putting solutions in place. Um, but a, a really good example of that is certainly with the work that we're doing around the stroke pathways at the moment, where we have good patient representation both at workshops but at, at our regular meeting who, as Atul's just alluded to there, absolutely bring us back to, to earth again um, around some of the explanations and the pathways. The dermatology pathway, I, I absolutely concur with, with how was put in to resolve an issue. Um, and we probably did that, that really, really quickly, not how you normally do a, an improvement piece of work. So some great learning for us as well as great improvement. example of this here um, and I think the uh, comments and discussion about the importance of uh, co-creation is a really good one both the reasons people have identified about services get better when they decide from the perspective of the patient but also the point that's been raised about if clinicians are having difficulty contemplating a change it's sometimes easier to do so having heard that advocacy from the patient firsthand so I think that's been a very helpful discussion and um, the other comment I would make uh, before we conclude the item is it's interesting, isn't it, as a board to get these examples brought to you? 
I think it would be very good as a board if we had an expectation about what are the pathways and services that are in any particular priority order for transformation and to what extent do they need any oversight or stewardship or support from the board because I'm conscious that I'm very pleased to be the recipient of this but we are somewhat pa passive recipients of what it is the improvement program bring to our attention and we've talked earlier today about the importance of transformation and raising some of the challenges rising some of the challenges we've got and um, I wonder if an action that also flows from this report today is for us as a board to agree what are the next five priority services or pathway for transformation. Would that be something you'd be happy to take away, Al? Um, yes. <laughs> um, noting the difficulties we, we can have sometimes. I, uh, just as a reflection, I think one thing that um, as a board we can do, it, it links into the, uh, the ICB and our kind of encouragement to other ICB members that we really do need to do this transformation and that sometimes people will need to be encouraged, shall we say, to participate in it and to, to reflect the difficulty that GPs are all independent little private practices effectively and there is a great difficulty on doing that but if we don't try to keep encouraging using patient partnership and involvement and um, we'll never get anywhere but the, the, the I think looking at the priority I, I think we are already looking at the areas yes. we know are priorities yeah. but we can, we can bring bring that and back, I'm yes. well aware the ask appears innocuous but is actually very significant uh, but we will um, you know we, we will be appreciative of your best efforts yes. in that direction and, and I guess the reflection is to, to us all this seems an absolute no-brainer but my goodness me, it's been a challenge and Derby have been told they're not allowed to do it and it's... Sure. <laughs> Could I just come in there? Um, well, my day job, I'm the same thing. I haven't been meant to do here, I'm not doing it. I just refuse to do stuff I'm do. I was looking at your roadmap for promoting the change going from January to February and thinking, why was that? I've never ever seen the change ever get successfully implemented in that short time scale. I have got the backdrop of an equally bureaucratic place to work. But to, go, to cut to it, one of the things that we have had to do is acknowledge that change and engagement is a specialism. Um, and we have bolstered our resources with change and engagement specialists who have done everything from problem you're trying to solve, your stakeholders, involving the right, whether it's patients or otherwise, and working out how you get everybody to align behind a solution and it's quite an, a magic art and I've mm -hmm. enjoyed some great people having with your team. Um, but I don't know whether we have that skill set here or whether we should be plugging to a system that in order to really get properly system changes where everybody's got their own agenda will require that the professional application of how you implement change across boundaries and it's not easy as, as this has clearly demonstrated. Wise Council. Thank you, Sue. Can I can I just a quick supplementary to that because the it, I was just interested in what you said there, Hal, about you know, what would be helpful would be this board helping. So the priorities are useful to see where we need to turn our attention. But could you articulate just what how we could help in a practical sense? Because actually you're you're trying to influence the wider system and if they don't want to do it, then it has to be at ICS level or that ICP board level that that, that change is, is mandated if it's not happening on a voluntary basis. So how practically can we assist in that process? So I was thinking in a in a, um, a sort of soft influence type way rather than you know that you needed to go to a committee and you know, sort of so, for example, the, the meeting that's um, that's next Monday, there's the you know the, the, the um, non execs and how it's all going to work in an ICS. That, that at meetings like that, to be voicing the opinion that you know some of the role of the ICB will be to hold people to account and to put 
pressure on people to a degree. It's, uh, that's the kind of thing I was meaning to, to keep in the first place to get the direction of travel going in the right way, that there needs to be a bit of bite behind some of the aspiration about transformation. We need to actually force it through to a degree. I think that's what yeah. was that's the main thank you. Very good. Um, great conversation and thank you very much for bringing it to us. I think the um, the general points that have come on the back of the specific example have uh, given us a rich discussion, so thank you for that. Um, we're now on to the final block of papers under the good governance section and we have two very substantive items. Um, the first is around the board assurance framework. Um, uh, which we need to look at the BAF report and then we've got the report of committee chairs which is the opportunity for the committee chairs to um, offer any observations on the BAF as well as escalating any items to board that are any cause for concern about the elements of the IPR their committee has responsibility for providing oversight on. So we're going to do all of that next. Um, Hal, do you want to lead off with the BAF? Um, indeed, but I'm going to sort of ask other people to um, comment on their in original um, particular areas. Um, I, I wonder if I could start just around the, the BAF one um, with a specific point for Berenice regarding um, stroke services and something that's been added to the BAF just to make board aware of the current situation around our stroke services and hyperacute stroke. Is, is that all right, Berenice? Thanks very much, Bath. Uh, Bath, Val, even. Oh, Bath. <laughs> um, yes, thank you. We, we have added recently. Can we just mute again? Sorry. Thanks. We've added recently uh, an additional. Thanks. <laughs> it's definitely worked that time. Uh, recently, an additional risk around stroke services. This additional risk has, has come to play because we've um, had some some additional changes in our stroke services um, just over the past uh, two or three weeks. So as, as everybody's aware, there is a, a stroke review underway anyway for Chesterfield, specifically around the, the hyperacute stroke unit and about whether we should be continuing to deliver services at Chesterfield Hospital given the, the, the pressures that we find ourselves in recruiting stroke consultants for this organisation, which is not only a, a Chesterfield problem, but it's actually a, a, a national problem. Um, just recently, we, we were made aware um, that one of our locum consultants actually had to leave at very short notice. And that, that's one of the problems with locums is that they don't have to give you much notice. And um, so it is much better to have substantive people in post. They had very valid reasons for why they had to leave the organisation quickly. And, and to the, at this point, we don't know if that person will return to, to us um, to, to support. This means that we're left with one substantive stroke consultant and one additional locum. Amongst those two, um, one of them, um, as part of their agreement to work with us a locum, um, they would be taking leave for, for two months uh, to return to their, their home country. Um, and that, that period is over July and August. So that then reduces us down to one stroke consultant. Uh, that stroke consultant has not had um, leave since since February and we're, it's really important that he absolutely is supported and taken some leave um, to make sure that he also doesn't fall over. Um, so that left us in a, an extremely vulnerable po position. We have taken a number of actions and we have been meeting as a system again. So there has been co people contributing from previously the CCG will be ICB. Um, from the Stroke Network, from our neighbouring trusts, uh, Derby, Kingsmill and Sheffield, and also the ambulance service in, in pulling to, together a plan. But my, my huge thanks mainly to the, the team on site who have um, day by day been working through a resolution to, to, to get us through this period of really in the main um, July and specifically from the 21st of uh, July through to the 3rd of August. 
we have got a number of mitigations in place. We are meeting next Monday um, to to feedback that th those mitigations to the network. Um, just to assure ourselves that we don't have to put a, a formal divert on. And what that would mean is that every patient that presents with the symptoms of stroke um, would then be diverted to the closest hospital um, at, dur during that one week period. Well, it's just over one week. It's about a 10 day period. Um, and we obviously want to avoid that. So I, I, I don't want to go through every single mitigation, but it, it does it does involve the emergency department. It involves um, clinical nurse support um, teams um, and, and a huge amount of work from our medical um, team in, in medicine itself. Um, everybody's kind of contributing to make sure that we come up with a, a robust plan to get us through that period. Given the risk, I thought it was important that it was uh, included into uh, BAP Risk 1. Thanks, Hal. Boardrooms on mute. Thanks. He's still shown mute. <laughs> John, are you able to take you off mute? I hope it isn't that I've just stunned everybody into silence. <laughs> That's great. Right. Thank, Thank you much, John. Um, so, uh, well, I was just saying, I didn't know if anyone had any questions about what the update Berenice has just given about about stroke, which is obviously a significant worry to to all of us. But I think we're managing it in a safe way a way as we possibly can and in consultation with neighbouring trusts as well. Yeah. Um, I think in, 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 uh, in an assurance sense uh, we might just go to Jane, Jane because I know you've been close to this. Um, so Helen we, we haven't yet um, considered it. Yeah. We haven't yet considered it through Quality Assurance Committee. Clearly, we've had the heads up about it. Um, we've clearly been having a further discussion about it on the 18th of July. Um, I think, though, the interesting thing is the length of time that we've been flagging the fragility of this service. And I know the execs have done everything they can to make sure that um, the HASU is able to continue in a safe way if that's the right thing for the patients in our neighbourhood. But um, it is sometimes very frustrating, isn't it? But I think it was predictable um, that at some point we would be in this position. And actually, it's interesting. Our conversations have to in include all of our strategic partners and commissioners, etc. But in the end, the solutions have to fall with us. And so, uh, you know, I do commend Berenice and the team for the work that they're doing and the dedication of the staff to actually trying to maintain a safe service on this, which is clearly the most important thing. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. I think the other thing I'd add to that is I'm also conscious that our executive colleagues have been very clear with system partners as to the fact that our kind of preference will be not to be running the service given the current risks, but um, uh, playing our full part in the system in order to mitigate the system risk, we will continue on providing the service and um, implementing these mitigations. So I think the deliberateness of that choice being offered to and explored with and I suppose ultimately declined by the system um, has been an important part of getting us to where it is we are now. And, and just as by way of reassurance linked to that, the clinical safety, because Athol was asking earlier about um, HSMR and the stroke specific bit of HSMR on the IPR and at the moment our HSMR is within the 
expected range. So we're, we're not flagging as um, outside of expected range from a safety point of view for the patients at the moment. But it is it is a worry. Thanks, Hal. I suggest now we go to the committee reports because that will allow us to pick up the BAF risks relevant to those committees as well as the IPR issues. And I find I'd like to start out of order, if I may, please, with Ian. Because Ian, that will also give you an opportunity to talk about the BAF round table, which will be helpful. OK, uh, thank you. Uh, perhaps just clear the other items out. Uh, Audit Committee have had two meetings in the last um, uh, sort of month or so. And... Um, the first meeting was very much around endorsing um, Quack increasing their BAF risk uh, one, um, and that was through the at that time was more driven through the maternity in Ockenden, um, and then sort of our second meeting was to receive the accounts and the counter fraud annual report. So I think yeah, very good news is that on the counter fraud we. A year ago, I think we were amber, a stroke, nearly red rated on some areas. We are green rated across the board this year. Uh, so well done for all the work that's uh, gone on across the entire um, hospital and RPC to uh, achieve that. The other good news is obviously we signed off the accounts at that time. And as Parliament wasn't really doing anything yesterday, we also laid the accounts of the hospital yesterday. So they have now been approved and gone through the parliamentary uh, process. Um, so well done to everyone on that. So that was kind of the, I'll call that the, the normal work. I guess moving to the BAF round table, I think um, we had a very engaged and good conversation about, um, feels like about 10 days ago, which is recorded here, which is trying to almost set up the sort of conditions to simplify the, the risk. I, I guess I've yeah had some correspondence with Berenice as to yeah, I, th I wonder if people get put off by the words BAF because every organisation does have strategic risks in the NHS and the health sector in general. We tend to call them BAFs and actually we're almost caught up in that. And our BAFs, BAFs are all about strategic risk and it's about trying to almost simplify the approach and to say, how do we have a, yeah, a clear view on a small number of strategic risks and the mitigations therein? And I guess I would given the conversation we've just had about stroke, one of the key things is about trying to understand how quickly and then something that we can see from maybe quite a long way away will become a key risk and how we manage that. So I think the workshops, and I might defer to Berenice here briefly, yeah, we've had one further workshop and we're trying to do workshops with each of the BAF areas. And I know certainly we're, we're picking up that in the people committee that's coming up next week. But Berenice, do you want to sort of reflect on the sort of second BAF workshop that you had? Thanks, Ian. Um, I, I did question my chair and ability of the workshop, um, given where we got to, Ian. But um, people said that uh, they felt it was a really helpful discussion that we had. I think it just posed more questions about whether we had the, the right areas included within our BAF rather than actually got us to a conclusion. And I know one of our specific aims of the first workshop was to talk about um, BAF 3 and whether that should be reworded. And we actually didn't get on to that at all. Um, so what, what we were really keen to do is the strategy paper that, that Hal presented earlier um, making sure that we're very clear on the areas that we're focused on as an organisation, understanding what the metrics, the high level metrics are for them and what risks might be associated with that. And then reviewing the BAF um, at that point in time is more or less where we where we got to. But we haven't had any of the um, committee workshops so far. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I think that's, yeah, Berenice, that sounds absolutely, feels like the right way forward, because otherwise the danger is we get sucked into the real operational detail and it's trying to keep it tied to that um, high level. And I guess I would reflect on the conversation we've had even in this meeting about saying, well, actually, look at BAF3. Actually, the risk might be almost written down the wrong way. And it's almost the, it's almost... Uh, BAF3 perhaps is a, yeah, one of the risks that we really own at the board level through through the hospital leadership team is to 
it's how do we interface and influence with the system to get the best outcomes from the system of which we are part and how that feeds into our own sort of legal entity so i don't know I, 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 I'm presuming, thank you. I'm presuming we're not taking any decision on BAT 3 today in advance of those wider discussions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can we go to you, Jane, please? Uh, thank you, Helen. Um, so, you've already heard that um, we've um, already reported to ARC about limited assurance from the QUAC meeting that was held on the 23rd of May. And in addition to the 23rd of May, we've also had an extraordinary and Quality Assurance Committee um, that we held yesterday. So if I go to the meeting on the 23rd of, the May, of May 1st, um, I'll just pull out um, just a couple of things um, before I go on to the two really meaty areas that I want to discuss. Um, so one of the things that I just wanted to point out was um, we've had lots of discussions on seven-day services at um, board, and actually some while ago, um, I can't really remember exactly, but, but I've got a feeling it was a couple of years ago. We actually decided that we would focus on two of the specific areas of seven-day services. Um, but interestingly, in um, Kevin Sargent updating us on seven-day services, he's actually um, come at this with fresh eyes and has actually um, uh, proposed to the committee that he comes back to us with a further paper that actually looks again at all of the 10 standards. And this is really important because actually it fits with some of the conversations that we've had earlier about workforce models um, and actually different roles um, that might be required within our organisation. Um, and those roles and models might be required actually to support the seven day agenda. So this is not just about medical cover. So I think that's a really, really positive move that we actually going to revisit where we're at with seven day um, services. So that was a really, really good story. Um, in terms of um, safer, uh, safer, uh, safer staffing, you, as usual, we've, we've received a, a similar reports to, what, to the report you've received yourself this morning. Um, so just to note that that's an ongoing item with Quality Assurance Committee. The two things of note that um, gave us cause for concern, which I will go into further detail when I talk about yesterday's meeting, um, were around maternity and also around um, the progress of the, the divisions in terms of um, where they're at, each individual division, where it's at in terms of its own divisional um, governance and assurance. So, for example, are all of our divisions in a similar state, if you like, in terms of their capability and uh, their delivery around their own assurance processes? So thinking about things like policies, knife, incidents, complaints, and actually, we were quite concerned at the meeting of the 23rd. Um, we have been monitoring progress of the divisions on an ongoing basis. Um, but it, what has become apparent is that some of the divisions are much less mature. And some of it is about pressure to, related to COVID. Um, but in particular, we could have some concerns around the, the performance of the medical division, um, particularly in delivering things like incident um, learning, etc. So... I think um, the committee was particularly um, concerned. So we've actually at that point said that this is tough love. And actually for the next meeting in July, we really do need to see some tra trajectories for improvement. We've recognised everything about COVID, um, but we need to see all of that in the round. And we need to see it um, uh, division by division because these things are actually used externally by our partners as quality markers. So there's been a degree of drift, but actually we feel we've got to the end of the line. So that report was asked for um, for the 18th of July, and I'll come back to that again in a moment. Similarly, around um, maternity, we've had some yo yo of our position through Quality Assurance Committee. Um, sometimes we've felt better assured, sometimes we haven't. Um, but particularly at this committee, we noted that um, we were beginning to have some slight uptick in our um, um, stillbirth um, rate. And also that um, there were there were a number of areas giving us concern about grip and pace and progress. So you heard as well earlier in the meeting that um, you know maternity is really important to us and it's obviously under great scrutiny. Um, but um, we are in a position now where we're kind of in a command and control um, situation with maternity in terms of delivering against Ockenden and also Kirkup and also about. Um, where we're going to end up a position this year on CNST, which is related on, related to all of those things. 
Um, so um, having had those concerns um, really, really surfaced, I'm not saying that they haven't been being monitored. What I'm saying is that at the May meeting, we really felt that we were running out of time. Um, we actually um, held an extraordinary MQAC yesterday. The recommendation from the meeting in May was um, regarding the BAF that we would ask for to increase the um, risk rating up to 16 and to note limited assurance against two areas, notably the, what I've just described on divisional governance and also on paternity. And that is out with any um, further discussion that board might want to have on stroke. So uh, that's certainly a proposal of an increase. I don't think that anything at the meeting yesterday alters that. Um, we had a very focused, um, extraordinary quack. It was supposed to be a single item quality assurance committee um, focusing on maternity. And there was some really good news. And I have to say, um, I really want to praise the team for the work that they've done, um, and particularly the execs for really getting a hold of this. Um, so yesterday we were able to agree um, that we have made significant progress. So against the Ockenden, um, immediate learning and essential actions, we will be able to show compliance moving from um, two out of seven to five out of seven areas of full compliance at the end of July. So that is a really, really much improved position. Um, I'll come back to the two that, we're in, that we don't show full compliance in a moment. Um, Kirkup as well, um, we were um, lacking in that and actually as of today, I'm hoping that Krishna is smiling. I can't see a face. But as of today, we should be able to show full compliance against Kirk up to date as well. So there is some movement. Um, but I have to say that I have to come to board with two asks um, to support two of the criteria, if you like, in, in Ockenden, which sit with saving babies' lives too. Uh, we've had quite a lot of conversation about this. Saving babies' lives too is a care bundle that supports... Um, the, the care, if you like, that is given to our, our mums and babies um, to reduce down to absolutely the very minimum the rate of stillbirths. And it contains, I think it's five criteria. And I, I need to say as well that if this is saving babies' lives too, it isn't saving babies' lives one. So this is building on previous care bundles as well. Um, so in order to um, achieve compliance on saving babies' lives too, we need um, some support from the board to escalate and to um, expedite, if you like, some delivery around the digital system of K2, um, which is required in terms of being able to demonstrate audit against the criteria. We also probably will require some further um, expertise and support in terms of leadership and governance to go into the maternity team, which we will need to um, heads up board that that might be a staffing aspect that needs to come to you further. In terms of saving babies' lives too, Krishna and I kind of were going into the meeting with a heavy heart saying that having had discussions with the obstetric team, Krishna was going to be proposing that we wouldn't be compliant until um, January 2023, which actually would have been um, two years down the line um, from when uh, Ockenden first reported which in itself seems a, a horrendously long period of time. Um, I think that it's important to note that we have made progress against saving babies' lives too, but it's actually our evidence against it that still remains a problem, and hence why I ask on K2. Ahead of the meeting yesterday, Krishna went to the region to um, talk about that timeline, and uh, we have got um, some general agreement that actually it's important that we're given some time to embed that, uh, the work that's required, and also, as I say, to in increase our uh, performance around the K2 system. So, um, committee agreed yesterday um, that um, we cannot let this go. We would want to see the command and control, if you like, structure of weekly meetings with paternity continue. And that out with our normal process from Quality Assurance Committee, we would like to see a um, report either come to Quality Assurance Committee or on the months that Quality Assurance Committee doesn't run. We would like to receive a briefing paper coming from Quality Delivery um, Committee that shows progress against um, that trajectory. And I guess that is the kind of the basis on which we have accepted uh, a trajectory to full compliance of um, January 2023. Um, so that is our, that's our main issue around um, Ockenden compliance and maternity. We also yesterday looked at some areas of concern. We looked at um, individual standalone papers 
on induction processes, how we're looking to modernise our induction and the implications that that will have for pressures on the birth centre. We looked at some um, work on postpartum haemorrhage because actually um, that is a national ask that we really focus on that. We have some um, recent um, cases of postpartum haemorrhage. But, um, we, I think we had three in one week, which was really quite of concern. And then um, also um, we were also thinking that we should look at some other matters that have, have come to our attention. So one was about third and fourth degree tears. So we've had some standalone papers as well, looking at individual items. Um, but most of these things also form part of our assurance that goes into our um, submission for clinical um, negligence scheme. So, um, so that was the substantive um, part of the meeting yesterday. And I'd say whilst it really demonstrates excellent progress and the, and the team were absolutely praised for the progress that has been made, um, I think we are still under some severe um, scrutiny from um, system partners and uh, it was quite a testing meeting. The second part of the meeting, actually, um, a paper came to the, um, the committee which we didn't discuss in detail yesterday. Um, out with the um, Quality Assurance Committee on May the 23rd, uh, it, the um, CCG partners requested a desktop review of divisional governments and uh, looking across the board at uh, what had been reported where and what systems and processes were still in place. Now, uh, you'll recall I just said that we've also asked for that ourselves to come to the meeting on July the 18th, but that was then requested separately by the system. We didn't feel that we had adequate time to respond to that report um, and it had already gone through a system meeting um, yesterday. Um, so actually we made that point and actually that um, report will come back in an agreed format to the July uh, 18th meeting of Quality Assurance Committee. Um, that in no way um, kind of mitigates the, the kind of the worries that we have around the grip and pace on divisional assurance and we do know that you know, we do have to um, make a significant amount of improvement uh, and regain some of the ground that's been lost due to COVID. So I'm not um, disputing any of the findings that were in that um, uh, desktop review done by system partners, but I do think that um, there was an element of we were already putting our own house in order and we just needed to be able to progress that. Um, so I've just given a very long report. Um, I think you'll understand why, and I think you will understand why we are requesting that board agree um, that um, the risk rating around um, BAF risk one is actually increased to at least 16. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. It says recording has stopped. It says it's still live at the top, so I'm not sure whether that's just a blip, but it would be an important to make sure we're being recorded. I'm just wondering if somebody at that end of the table would be willing to relieve poor John of trying to take the yeah, note yeah. and manage the mouse. Because I just think it's, it's a bit, um, it's a bit um, much yeah. to keep across both things. So I think we could do the team effort. Thank you, Nora. Volunteers worth a thousand pressed men. Um, thank you very much for that report, Jane. It was necessarily long and very comprehensive and uh, very assuring in terms of um, understanding the evidence that you have mined at Quack to form the conclusions that you have, and we're grateful. Um, now, that conversation could go off in a whole number of directions, but I would like to focus us, at least initially, on Jane's asks, which is about moving BAF 1 to at least 16. And the second are the two specific asks you had, Jane, that have both um, implications for prioritisation and potentially resources. Um, and I think you need a decision in principle around those while the detail of making them happen gets worked up. So on those uh, contributions on those specific asks first, please. Can I assume, therefore, that everybody is content to proceed on that basis? Yes. Thank you yes. very much. Yes. Um, Jeremy, do you want to come in? Uh, no. No, oh, sorry, no. I thought no. I saw your hand. Does anybody want to um, question or query or comment on anything Jane has said? Krishna. Thank you. Only just to come back to, I'm not sure if I if I heard, but obviously 
what we felt at the end of the meeting yesterday that we were significantly assured that the team were were on it and one of the things that I said at the meeting is we have to trust what the teams are telling us about their capability and capacity to be able to undertake the massive undertaking and we did have that sense of, of assurance that, that you know we, they need our support to give them a bit, a bit of leeway and license to if they've said it's going to be January we'll monitor that and we'll provide the um, assurance to through QC to, to Quark but we do need to give them a bit of leeway in that the team is you can see a, a cultural change within the team um, and it is a wider team we're not you know relying on one person and I think that came through loud and clear I think her new head of midwifery um, has done some sterling work in the very short time that she's been here and she's sort of come in at a time of, of massive change and I think great credit really to, to her needs to be played really because it's been really really challenging for her and she's been under a lot of um, scrutiny I think it is not you know not just for ourselves but from external partners as well as part of the, um, the, the, the system partners so you know they've got our full support we, we're continuing to do that from assurance point of view continuing to do that weekly monitoring but actually you can see there is a sea change and we talked about culture earlier and there is certainly a, a definite culture change positive cultural change within the team working together and i think that just needs to be recognized as well that's uh, excellent here thank you krishna for that addition at all i think if, if, you know if you could change culture uh, with some kind of magic wand to do it like that yes. um and i think uh, one of the my reflections on yesterday's meeting is that we have been on the case of maternity since at least last year, if not before. And uh, there have been changes made, uh, new people have come in, uh, bedding, and then all this kind of stuff. So I think our regional colleagues' interest in this area may have well sparked from you know, the recent London report and so on. So, oh, you know, oh, what's happening in our region about, oh, look at this. Um, but we have been on the case for much longer. Cultural change does take a, a while to, to bed in. What I was um, particularly impressed by yesterday was the level of energy uh, for Amanda. I mean, it's very easy to spot if somebody is just trying to, you know, flannel their way through something. I think we all we, we all can recognise flannel when we see it, can't we? Um, and there wasn't any of that. Uh, there was. Uh, a, a very uh, a good approach to all the complex issues within that. And I think the way it was laid out, I know we have some issues about the quality of papers, but I think the way it was split up for me, I found it easier to understand how postpartum fitted in with saving babies' lives and all this kind of stuff. It's very easy to get lost in all of that kind of jargon. So uh, that was made clear, uh, and, and, and that kind of... Uh, 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 energy was, wasn't was just in one person, you could see it in other members of the team who came in in support. So looking at the human factors as well as the kind of intellectual content of all these things, I think is important to get that feel and to get that assurance. So so that's what I got. I think the important thing to stress and to, to, to note, John, for the minutes, is that we have picked these issues up first, uh, regardless of what anybody else has been saying. It's been helpful to have uh, regional and other rise in terms of uh, what peers are doing, all that kind of stuff. Our problems are our own and we are dealing with them. And I think in, 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 a, in a measured and proper way, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. That's um, a helpful set of observations from yesterday. Okay, do you want to add to that? Yes. Uh, just in the national context, if we've learned nothing else about some of the um, awful sort of scenarios playing out in potentially different organisations. It's about we need we don't need to tick the box, box and miss the point and that's what the team was very much, they want to socialise the changes, get them embedded and that will take time. We don't want to go for what we could change all the guidelines within a week but, but there wouldn't be any embedding and we wouldn't do that embedded change and, and that for me is that safety concern. So I absolutely fully support the teams in having that six month period to continue doing what they're doing because by by that time we will make it a safer um, service going forward and that's really important. Thank you. Um, our colleagues content to leave that item there, large and all as it is. Um, thank you for that update and uh, those clear um, escalations and uh, actions on the back of it.
Um, Keith. Um, well, so I guess I, I don't think there's a full update to give Helen in the sense that I think we talked quite openly about finance performance in the morning section, if that makes sense. Um, so I think we have the second part of finance performance to pick up uh, on um, a week on Friday, where we, where I think the main, well, the, the the key topic of discussion is back risk on four and five performance and finance. Um, Four is already, performance is already sitting at 16 anyway, um, but finance is sitting at 12 and I think therefore will need to be escalated and we'll have to have a debate about the level of that escalation, but I think we'll, flagging that now, we'll need to escalate. And my suggestion is we then circulate that around the board in advance rather than waiting for the next board meeting because technically it should have come to stay, Helen, if that makes sense. Um, uh, beyond that, I think that the majority of the conversation was about what we talked about this morning, which is about performance and about finance and we're now, from a finance performance point of view, which I think is the right thing, viewing them as one item rather than two separate items. So we're treating it as finance and performance linked together because it's impossible to pull it apart in reality, even more so in the current circumstances. So we'll have the meeting on Friday um, and we'll join the minutes together of the two meetings effectively and, re and report back on the increased back risk, but finance back risk will have to rise. And we'll take that by correspondence. Yeah, um, if if you're comfortable meetings. with that, I appreciate yeah. that. We're, we're all finance performance meetings are always quite close to the board anyway, yeah. and it tends to be verbal. But because of having to reorganise, we've slipped past the board, that's, unfortunately. That's absolutely fine. But helpful to have had the heads up and be put on notice today. Any questions for Keith around that, or in anticipation of a recommendation for an escalation in the finance risk? No, content to wait that, await that. Thank you very much, Keith. Um, so that brings us on to the last substantive item of the day. Apologies that we're a bit late getting to it, uh, particularly when we have colleagues joining the call. But it's the staff and, uh, patient and staff experience report. And um, the delights today that I've been long awaiting, actually, and really delighted that we've got it today, um, albeit I suspect we're going to have, to have a slightly more truncated version of the care opinion package. Um, so, Krishna, you've got colleagues in attendance. I can see Anne. And also Sarah, who, thank you very much for joining us, Sarah. I do believe you have COVID, so um, <laughs> you're not too unwell. I do, I do. I'll, I'll be going back to bed after that. I'm really glad to be here. Now, I'm just conscious of time, and we have got a, we have got a presentation that we can circulate afterwards. But I wondered whether it'd be helpful, Sarah, just to sort of put in context where we are, because we are very much at the start of our journey. So I think it's sort of slide 11. So instead of sharing that presentation, whether that would be really helpful, it's it's got some of the comments and things in the presentation that I think um, sort of trust board would really appreciate, but. I suppose we're not quite as far as we would want, but I suppose from your your part of care opinion, aren't you, Sarah? If you want to sort of introduce yourself, you can put in context about that journey that we're on from um, understanding our real time patient experience being that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. I'm Sarah Schurst. I'm one of the associate directors at, at Care Opinion. Um, so just as a just for a bit of context setting, if people aren't aware, Care Opinion we're a social enterprise that provides a website for people to leave anonymous feedback about healthcare. Um, and we've been running for the last seventeen plus years. So people can feedback online um, either via or via a kiosk or via a leaflet or the telephone. Um, it's then moderated by us here at Care Opinion. It's not like kind of Google reviews or, or Facebook. And then we invite services to come on and respond to that feedback to show um, whether they're making learning or, or making changes as a result of that feedback. And I think um, you say you're not as far on as you'd like to be with this journey. And I know Anne will go and give you an update in a second. Um, but just to say when an organisation takes a step to subscribe to Care Opinion. Those, these first few months are quite hard embedding Care Opinion. Um, I know you mentioned previously, I was in the meeting a little bit earlier, we talked about culture change um, and it can be a culture change, getting staff to feel confident and happy, asking for people to give anonymous feedback about their care um, and also feeling confident enough to then respond to that feedback um, about care. So. I'll hand over to Anne, who can give you those updates on from those that slide number that you mentioned. Um, but I am willing also to take any questions about care opinion generally. Anne, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. 
Um, so we started at the beginning of January. We piloted it in surgery division and then are also starting to pilot it in maternity. That still means that anybody who receives a service anywhere else in the organisation can still comment. It's just that somebody centrally from my team will respond. We are undertaking work to try and increase, as Sarah said, the number of comments. At the moment, we've had the same amount of comments up until the end of May that we did have for the whole of last year. So we have increased. We're looking at various forums, leaflets, QR codes, um, giving some um, little business cards to the uh, receptionists, the welcome desks in areas and also to the... Um, admin staff within the wards to encourage them to give them out. We're looking at using our volunteer service to go around and support individuals giving the feedback at the time. We have a uh, patient advice and liaison service. So again, we're looking at anybody who goes in there and provides comments, actually helping them and supporting them there and then to put it on. And I think that's some of the work that we still need to do. It's very easy to give somebody a card and say, go away um, and complete it when you get back. It's that work after of um, let's get it done at the time and let's support you and deal with those uh, issues that you're raising at that time. So that's the work that we're trying to undertake at the moment. Um, surgery have really taken this um, really well. Unfortunately, we haven't had many responses that surgery have been able to respond to, but they're really keen and really supportive of using this. Yes, um, and then just just to say, I wanted to just touch on some research recently from uh, Baines in 2019 that looked at an organisation that had taken on care opinion whilst in special measures, because I think there's not just the benefit to our patients and service users through using this uh, that identified uh, 24 positive impacts on the organisation and on staff. So um, it talked about the ability to publicly demonstrate change um, uh, increasing staff resilience, pride and morale, um, and also, you know, being able to kind of get that authentic feedback coming coming through about services. So, you know, you are at the start of this journey, but what we're hoping to see over the next couple of months is the increase in comments. Um, so patients feel like they can be heard, but also that staff feel responsible for that feedback and um, that that feedback's part of what they do around Two thirds of all feedback we get on care opinion is entirely positive. So we fill a big function of allowing that praise to publicly be passed on to staff. And that can really help around that staff resilience and, and, uh, and staff morale as well. So then when you come across some feedback that's more critical because stuff does happen, uh, staff should feel like they're more able to deal with that feedback, look at how they can make changes rather than feeling like, OK, this is uh, someone attacking me or um and be able to kind of look at that more objectively i think a big part of what i guess the board can do to support this work um again that same research told us that getting stakeholder buy-in particular at a senior level the quote from the research was get your board on board um because if frontline staff see that this is valuable within the organization that it's been referenced throughout the organization they're more likely to ask patients for that feedback because they know that that's going to be recognized higher up um so i guess that would be my ask today uh, from the board would be public public support organizationally being publicly supporting this um would be a huge help in getting it off the ground is there any questions or comments? Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, and that's been a fabulous uh, presentation. Um, and I can assure you there'll be no lack of um, support in this boardroom for what it is you're trying to do. And in fact, to that end, I'd quite like to suggest, Krishna, that we have this as a kind of a, a part of this regular report so that every time we meet, we're looking at whatever the most up-to-date uh, care opinion information we can get is. Um, all, of course, as part of our trajectory to real-time uh, patient feedback. And we had a, an excellent conversation, Sarah, that you will have missed earlier about the importance of kind of co-creation with patients when you're doing service redesign. Not only because you get a better design, uh, but also because it helps clinicians call out and advocate for and on behalf of patients. And I feel sure um, when there's good feedback, particularly when there's less good feedback, that we will be empowering our staff 
to make demands of us to support them and making the necessary changes, which I'm sure will be really culturally potent too. So um, I think I hope you have a sense of our excitement about all of this, and it's great to have it here today. Any comments or questions before we conclude this item and look forward to it again next time we meet? Just hooray. Hooray. Yes. <coughs> hooray. Lots of hoorays. And I think we should comment that this should go in parallel with other work around real-time feedback from patients on the, yes. on the ward. So it's not an it's either not or. Yeah. And John is doing some work for us from an IT point of view about what we can do. So that's also in progress. Yeah. Which is excellent. Really excellent. So thank you for getting out of your sick bed. And uh, we would like to release you back into it. And uh, a huge thanks to Anne, who's making such a fabulous positive impact on the adoption of this. Um, so we're very grateful to you. Thank you, Anne, and thanks thank for coming today. Thanks so much, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that um, concludes the um, agenda today, other than the consent items, which I've had no advance notice of anybody wanting to raise anything. So all those matters are deemed um, noted or approved as is relevant. Um, are there any items of AOB? I think Ian, wanted Ian had one, isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, just really by way of an update, obviously, for those of you in Chesterfield, there's a large building out the front these days. Um, which is great. So the good news is that um, the UECD project remains on track across a number of measures. Um, we've got, as any build project has, a number of commercial challenges at the moment, and those challenges often come around the, what was really specified one, two years ago compared to what's been delivered now. Um, and I think I'm, I'm really, I, I guess what I'd say, I'm really gratified that there's been shall we say, quite a good commercial approach being taken from um, the CRH side. I know that's led by Berenice and her team um, and sort of, yeah, managing our suppliers tightly um, and therefore we, yeah, not bearing some costs that I think otherwise might we might have received. Um, we've had a, from some few challenges around getting momentum around workforce planning and I guess one of the reasons to raise it is almost linking back to the the two um, substantive items we've had today. Um, I think we it's the one one sort of stream within this project that has gone from amber to red and has remained red for a while. Um, we are we are going through some recruitment at the moment to try and bring people on board. But I guess the the one area that I would say is that we've bu we've built a UECD that is fit for future purpose. And our challenge will be having a workforce that is probably more almost at the tactical end, so that we will probably have a we'll probably have almost surplus capacity in the building when we sort of open it next year, because actually some of that workforce planning and getting the right people in place may take slightly longer. We'll obviously be delivering a service at least as good as we are now, probably better, facilitated by a better building, but we probably have a bit of a way to go on effectively future proofing the workforce plan against a enhanced building so i think that's one area just that we continue to keep a, sh a strong eye on and i yeah i'm delighted that um caroline particularly she's come into the hrd role has taken and gripped that uh, more strongly and that's helping the project going forward i think the the other area we, we always worry about money um I think within the project's envelope, we are continuing to be on track for capital, but obviously we've had that from Steve Heppenstall in the earlier presentation around the, the pressure on trying to reduce capital um, sort of for this current year, but we're on track within capital. I think at this stage of uh, any build, we'll have a risk contingency in place. We've got a number of the, or part of that risk allocated out. Um, so I guess as you start to run towards the, the project end, it's just how those risks play out against that contingency at the moment. Um, we're the right side of the line, but it's pretty tight. But I guess given given the sort of profile of that, I just wanted the board to be aware. Um, yeah, we're still on track for delivery in each of our parameters, and we just yeah we yeah probably just need a bit more refinement about the the workforce plan. So I'm happy to take any questions. And I'd love you to hear also about the um, impact Caroline's having on that uh, particular workforce challenge. Berenice. 
Th thanks, Helen. J just to, to respond to, to Ian's concerns, um, I, I, I mean, he is fully aware that we have actually flagged the workforce gap for for quite some time now, and that that expertise that there is towards workforce planning across a, a number of organisations. So as Ian says, we are trying to recruit to that role, um, but it is a concern because obviously our programme director is taking a lead on workforce at the moment, now supported by Caroline, which is is really helpful, and um, to make sure we drive that forward. But it's important to say that the workforce planning app absolutely must go hand in hand with the pathway development um, and that's where our focus is at the moment to make sure that we as part of the transformation work anyway we're testing out some of those pathways so that when we move into the new build we actually get diff slightly different models delivering um, and it's the workforce that we need we need to know what the pathways are to, to know what the workforce is that needs to to support that so um that that piece work is definitely well underway and we've got the commitments from each of the divisions on their their elements of it um but acknowledge the the financial elements and that was discussed quite a lot at board i didn't know whether at a future meeting helen you might want to consider a bit of an update for the board as to progress that's been made around the uecd bill because we are pretty well on our way and there is far more to show um, people uh, around progress. Thanks. And of course, one that we've taken you up on in the context of the annual members meeting. So I think there's going to be a real treat there in terms of being able to see it and walk through it, and, well, not physically, but you know, virtually and all the rest of it. So um, thank you for that. So um, I'm just going to note that the next meeting is on the 7th of September and before we conclude, ask for some reflections on the meeting, bearing in mind, of course, the board has a short private session now. So I think I might go to Margaret and Carol and if there's any pressing other feedback for this particular um, session now at all um, and if anybody else wants to indicate, we'll, we'll, well, we'll take those three and, um, and uh, call the meeting to a close. Margaret. Thank you, Helen. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, my overwhelming sense of that this morning is just the enormous challenges that are being faced, not only by the trust but by the health service in, in general and, and the whole system. But really good to hear people, you know, reminding us that patient experience is is really vital. So when we're when we are, whatever we're doing, we need to bear in mind the patient experience, and that's been brought through loud and clear. And also some things about uh, transformation and, and system working. In terms of um, pa patient in, in engagement and, and involvement in in changes, it's something that I particularly want to have a conversation with you, Helen, about sometime because it's obviously something I hear talked about in system wide in terms of the engagement um, that committee and and how I want to really get my head around how we actually um, feed into that or work together with with the the system engagement team so it was good that that sort of came out a bit today so uh, it's a conversation maybe we can have um, at some time separately. <clears throat> thank you and thank you for those observations. Carol's mic and camera are playing up so she can hear us <laughs> and we can be able to hear her so let's go to Atul and then Jane. Uh, you, you know me to be quite complimentary when things are, are good um, uh, today I've got a little bit irritated, I have to say, in terms of presentation of papers, the wording of recommendations, and starting off, I'll take the paper as read, and then 10 minutes of presentation. So, I, 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 in, in order to be sort of constructive, I'm quite happy to work with colleagues to help tighten that up. Uh, I have noticed this as a, as, as, as a failing before, I haven't said very much about it because I think you've got more things on your plate uh, that are, could be argued as being important. But I think as we now move into things like transformation, a new executive team and all that kind of stuff, I'm quite happy to give some of my time to help, not just the executive level, but one or two levels below that actually draft papers. Um, you know, we've had things asked of us today, uh, varying from the vague to, the, to review the paper, to some, uh, specifics like noting and, and, and all that kind of stuff. There was one where you were asking us to endorse something and the word endorse wasn't used. And I think these things are important at a point in time, particularly when 
I know you're bringing papers to us mainly, in some cases, to be written into the record. And if they are to be written into the record, that they have to be written into the record properly. So uh, a little bit of tetchiness on my part, forgive me. I think it's been a very positive meeting overall. Maybe it's because we're all together, I don't know, or some of us are together. I think it's a very pertinent observation, and I think it's a very generous offer. Um, thank you very much, Ashton. Jane. Um, Graham, Graham messaged me to say what I mentioned, the, the microphone issue. Um, I think it's relatively minor whilst we get it sorted, but uh, it has been quite difficult for those of us that are remote. I, I wanted to say something positive, though, about our executive colleagues, actually. I wanted to say how um, how relaxed they look in presenting to board today. And I, I don't mean relaxed in a bad way. I mean as if um, they are... Uh, really feel that they're in control of the things that they want to say. So I, I hear what Atul said, um, but I really I thought that they did very well today in um, in working as a team and kind of um, really leading us to the discussions of the right things. So we may not have minuted it and we might not have used the right language, but my sense is there's a bit of a relaxation in the team and, and I wonder whether that is down to the leadership of HAL already and, and I think that's, you know, if that's the right direction of travel and that's where we need to be. So I just feel like it was just a, a better meeting. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for that, Jane. And it's nice for you to bring that to the fore, not least of all as you're on the other end of the camera, because I'd absolutely concur. It's felt there's been very nice, uh, there's been a nice vibe, if that's not too trendy a word, nice mood in the room today. Um, and of course, a lot of work by colleagues to make sure in advance that we have good quality conversations today. So thank you all for that. Um, apologies that we're running late and uh, we will conclude proceedings there. And uh, thank you all and look forward to seeing you again at the beginning of September.